So, hello. Um, my name is Nuno. It's a pleasure to be here. I am uh, a lawyer, although just like my Catholic background, I don't practice at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I have been making music as well for the past 15 or so years of my life. And I had to make both of these ideas come together in a way. So while studying law, I got interested in the aspects of law that govern creativity and artistic practice and intellectual creation. Um, or you could say that I was interested in how can I make music, how can I make money through my music besides uh, playing? That's also an aspect of it. So right now I don't work as a lawyer, but I, I, I did work with uh, musicians, visual artists. I've uh, mostly worked in copyright issues. Um, I've worked in contracts. I've also worked in uh, going to court and suing someone for copyright infringement. So a very broad uh, experience. And today I work in cultural management um, in, in the city of Porto and I keep having issues with copyright all the time. So even if I try to escape <laughs> this area, this field where I, where I was working, copyright keeps coming back in one way or another. Um, so what I want to do today is I want to give you a very light grasp on ideas behind copyright. So we're going to start with, well, trying to figure out, figure out what the hell it is, <laughs> actually. And from my personal experience, um, understanding where it came from, how it was implemented, and what purpose does it serve in society is one way to go at it. It's a, a good way to go at it, actually. So for me, while I was studying law, I didn't, there, there's no specific, if you're doing a law degree in Portugal at least, there's no specific um, discipline where you study copyright. So in a way, I had to go at it through my personal interest as an artist, which is interesting because I was actually studying law. Um, so what, you, what, I, what, what I, I'm trying to replicate today is actually this process of understanding what it, is, what it is and how it happened and what purpose it serves, right? So for starters, what is copyright after all? And we could maybe um, say from a law perspective that copyright is an area of intellectual property that governs the protection of the work deriving from an author's intellectual creation. There's, it's a very wordsy sentence. <laughs> it's a, the type of sentence you would, you would come across um, a textbook like this, a uh, copyright textbook. Not the kind of wordings you would come across on a book like this. We actually have the, the author here today. <laughs> um, and today I'm going to try to strike a balance between these two ideas. So I will talk in very colloquial terms at times, but I will also talk from the perspective of the law. So a lot of the things I'm going to say don't necessarily reflect my personal position, but I want to give you an idea of the, the setting, if you're a, a, a creative person, if you're an artist, the setting of, of where, you, where, do you where the society usually stands in terms of copyright. So we can try to translate this into a more colloquial language, no? So we could say, basically, copyright grants the ability for authors to have control over what happens 
to their work. This is a more understandable idea, actually. You could also say that copyright regulates who and in what form can benefit economically from the use of intellectual works. So these are all different approaches and they're all correct, actually. Um, so one thing that I think we're going to talk about a lot and that we're going to, to understand is implementation of copyright and improvement developments in copyright law come from a specific tension between creativity and economic benefit. So most copyright developments, I would argue, come from a need from a specific intellectual property industry to engage with money-making policies, basically. But that's not all. Actually, the, the basic idea of copyright, this idea of protecting the author, which is a very noble idea, it's, it's still there. So this tension, this, which is in increasing actually, this tension is always present in copyright development. So let's start from the beginning. Copyright, the name itself, in, in Portuguese we say direito d'autor, uh, in French droit d'autor, so author's right, and copyright, which is a bit different, the idea is a bit different here. We'll get to there, <laughs> we'll get to that. But um, copyright basically covers the reproduction of works. So you could argue that copyright is something very recent in terms of the human history of um, intellectual works. I mean, you, if you went 2000 years in the past to a Roman house and asked someone if this work is protected by copyright, they would have absolutely no idea uh, what you were talking about. But that doesn't mean that authorship was not recognize. So for instance, um, Romans would punish actually if you try to pass your work, someone else's work as your own, you would be punished as a thief basically. Uh, so the idea, this idea of protecting the author is always there, but the connection to copyright and the control of reproduction of works was not always there. And there's a pretty good reason for it, because Copying was slow, basically. So copying was a laborious and slow task, commissioned usually by a cultural elite without a commercial intent. We were talking about the Romans. The Romans would have pretty big, if you're a, a wealthy Roman senator, you would have probably a, a very big uh, library. And that library, based, how we constructed that library was basically receiving um, a text from your friend and enjoying it and asking someone, paying someone to copy it and then you would have your copy. So copies would take a lot of time, they would take a lot of work and also there was not a lot of people able to consume these copies, not a lot of people could read. I'm, I know this is a music industry setting, but something that we're going to understand really fast as well is that copyright comes from a very literary background because, because of this idea of being concerned with the reproduction of works. Before technological innovations, you could only set one type of intellectual work, which was written, written works. So. This goes on and on and on. In the medieval ages, you can see, like the, the, I think it's pictured here, this monk copying texts. Copies would take a really, really long time. But then in the 1400s, something incredible happened. In the 1400s, the printing press was invented by Gutenberg. Not pictured here. <laughs> This is not Gutenberg's printing press. <laughs> um, 
but you get the idea. So suddenly, at an unprecedented rate, works could be copied. And it ushered an, um, a, an era of spread of literary works and also of their ideas. So first it was sort of this wild west, there was not a lot of presses, but there was nothing regulating the use of, of these presses as well. Uh, but these ideas, you know, ideas can be dangerous. <laughs> So the fear of rapid spread of subver subversive ideas made it uh, necessary to legally regulate um, the printing of works. So specifically in the context of Europe, Catholic Church would obviously be concerned with the spread of uh, other ideas that might um, in a way undermine their, their power. So suddenly, control over knowledge and control over the spread of that knowledge um, starts to impose restrictions on what gets to be copied and how. Um, so the first copyright innovation actually does not protect authors. So <laughs> it's interesting that most uh, contemporary copyright um, language focus on the author, but the very first innovation in copyright, the very first innovations in copyright actually protect those who are able to reproduce works. So the first regu regulations were aimed at publishers. So publishers usually were industry people who had enough money to invest on a printing press and they would be given privileges uh, territorial privileges, for instance, you are the only one who can print in this specific region, but also thematic, um, thematic uh, privileges. There's publishers who, who could only print Aristoteles' works, for instance, or there's publishers who, who had the privilege of printing the Bible, for instance. They, they were the only ones in a specific region who could do it. So. This is the, the, first, the first setting of protecting copyright. You would have a printing press, you would have faster, a faster way to, to, to reproduce works and you would have to control how those works were, were reproduced. So authors were not yet part of the equation. But then, in the UK, um, we have a very important law called the Statute of Queen Anne. So the Statute of Queen Anne, or the long form name, an act for the encouragement of learning by vesting the copies of printing books in the authors or purchasers of such copies during the times the Wren mentioned, <laughs> that's the long form name, short for Statute of Anne, uh, was a law passed in 1710 in the UK which uh, granted authors a 14-year exclusivity for the reproduction of works, using specifically the word copyright. So, for the first time, authors could decide whether their works could be reproduced or not. Um, and they gave them a 14-year exclusivity. After that, it's a free-for-all. So for 14 years, authors could decide who gets to publish, negotiate, uh, what the revenues are, and uh, after these 14 year terms, actually they could, they could ask for an, ex for an extension if they were still alive. <laughs> they could ask for a 14 year extension. Um, but after this, ideally after this 14 year exclusivity, um, it's a free for all because it was argued that you had to strike a balance between the artist, the author's revenue and the public interest in accessing a work. This is also a tension that we're going to see throughout the development of copyrights and still today. And it's a big issue. Uh, on one hand, you have 
the public interest and also the free flow of ideas and the developments that are possible through this free, free flow of ideas. And on the other hand, the protection of the authors, um, making it possible for them to make a living out of their creations and also to control what, what is done with their creations. Um, so with the statue of, of, uh, statue of, of Anne, um, focused on literary works, writings, it said. Specifically, it said writings, literary works and other writings, I think was, is the wording. So in 1777, you have this big case called Bach v. Longman. Uh, not that Bach, his son, actually, his eighth son, I think, <laughs> uh, who sued um, the London publishers Longman and Lucky, they were reproducing, he was also a composer, and they were reproducing his compositions. So the court understood that the statute meant um, literary works and other writings, so music is written in a specific language. So this is the first time in, in, in maybe the history <laughs> Of, of the world that uh, musical works would be protected by copyright. Um, which for, for those of us here, I, I know, that, again, the focus here is, is the, the music industry. I think it's a, 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 a nice piece of information that the first copyright uh, issue came from Bach. <laughs> well, his son, actually. Um, we have another, close to this time, we have another major, major historical um, event called the French Revolution. So the French Revolution brought major innovations to copyright. Uh, and one of those, one of, one of the innovations was copyright suddenly gained the nature of property. So the French Revolution was all about property <laughs> against the tyranny of, of the crown. People were free to own and possess land and objects and intellectual uh, creations. So the French Revolution brought this innovation and also the idea that authors, uh, authors protection should be extended to other modes, other cat categories of works and other modes of reproduction. So suddenly, not only literature and music, but also architecture, architecture, sculpting, painting, engraving, whatever the mode of intellectual expression, it should be protected. Uh, but it also brought a major, major innovation, which was well, death does not do us part. <laughs> For the first time, the protection was granted even after the death of the author for a period of 10 years. And these two ideas are very closely related. So on the one hand, you have uh, in the UK this idea of reproduction and controlling the reproduction. But suddenly you're talking about property of intellectual works, which is a bit different. And what do you do with property? Well, hopefully you make revenue out of it and that revenue will also be very good for your heirs. <laughs> so you try to make your heirs inherit your home and your riches and now also your intellectual property. So there's limitations to this. They still this tension between the free flow of ideas and the public interest in accessing works. Um, so it was for a period of 10 years. But very, very quickly, um, this was not the case. So in the late um, 19th, well, yeah, in the late 19th century, uh, it was already 20 or 30 years in some, in some uh, regulations. 
So I was talking about this difference between the UK, this approach between the UK and, um, and France. Um, and this is what we could call the difference between copyright and droit d'autor. So France's ideas started spreading throughout continental Europe and contrasted with the attitude towards copyright from the UK and the US. You could say that while France was concerned with the, the property and the naturalist side of it as something, um, there was, there was something more than just the act of reproduction that should be protected. The author itself should be, uh, should be protected. So the UK and the US were more concerned with the practical commercial aspects of reproduction and revenue making from, from that reproduction. Um, things during the 19th century started getting a bit more serious. And over here in Portugal specifically, writers um, and, and um, scientific researchers were the main propon proponents of copyright legislation. So our copyright legislation in Portugal came a bit uh, late compared to the rest of Europe, which is not news to anyone who has been living in Portugal and knows how things can come always with a bit of a delay over here. Um, so in the 19th century, very famous romantic uh, writers such as Almeida Garret argued for uh, the protection or strong, stronger protection for, for authors. But also during the 19th century, and especially during the early 20th century, um, more technological developments came. And suddenly you could not only press um, literary works, so you could not only fix into a material, um, material um, thing, object, literary works, but also other forms of artistic expression. So new technological means made it possible to capture and reproduce interpretations and performances. So musicians, singers, dancers, actors, and other performers became entitled, but not only performers, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see that later, uh, became entitled to protection. And these are known as neighboring or related rights. Here in Portugal, uh, this distinction is very clear because the entities that take care of these, of these uh, um, collective management of these rights are probably very well known to all of us. E everyone knows SPA, of course, but m you might have heard about GDA, for instance. And some people think these are the same or work in the same, uh, work with the same uh, rights. It's, it's not, correct and we're going to understand later what are related rights and why are they protected and why should they should be protected. But just to get the idea, suddenly you can start recording music and you can start filming and you can start, so you could start filming for instance a ballet or a, a musical play or a theater play. And the people who are performing this, uh, these works, they're basically an extension of uh, the work of art itself. Without these performances, there's no, um, there's no work of art. So the 20th century brings this innovation, but also brings globalization and brings uh, even faster ways to reproduce and distribute works of art or intellectual creation. So uh, this, this development means reproduction and distribution at the, uh, at the global scale and suddenly authors have become unable to individually authorize every use of their work. So we can maybe try to understand this a little better. So imagine that you are the Beatles, 
and the Beatles are now a very, very, very famous band. And the Beatles, um, they have authored, John Lennon and Paul McCartney have authored probably 80% of, of their songs. So John Lennon is sitting at home being the author, an amazing author of, this, of these works. And uh, as the author, he is the only one who can authorize the use and reproduction of these works, right? But the Beatles play on the radio thousands and thousands and thousands of times. So it's physically impossible to negotiate every time and authorize every time a Beatles song plays on the radio. So how do you solve this issue? And that's where collective management, which is a very recent innovation. Um, here in Portugal, it basically only happened after the revolution in 74, so it's a late 70s, early 1980s innovation. Um, collective management of rights um, tries to solve this issue, and we will see specifically later this afternoon in what, what strategies and in what ways. So, although the law concerns authors, if you read the text of the law 100% of the times it will, it will talk about authors, the main drivers of innovations in copyright are entities that benefit the most economically from this protection. So one thing I ask always when I'm, when I'm, um, when I'm talking about copyright, I usually ask, and I, I didn't tell you before, but this is absolutely a two-way channel here, okay? Feel free to interrupt me and make questions and, <laughs> and discuss uh, whatever, whatever uh, idea is being talked about. So one of the things that I usually always ask is, what is Disney? What does Disney do? the company, Disney, what does it do? Can somebody take a uh, guess? Please do talk. <laughs> Don't make me feel like this is a... It's the most efficient thing and it does the microphone. I think they... I'm not sure if this is on. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, it is. Okay. Uh, I think they distribute content. I also think they have some in-house creatives to create new stuff. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's a pretty good guess. What? Anyone else wants to chip in? Uh, I don't know if this is related to copyright per se, but uh, I feel Disney's known for. I know th this is the right word, but conducting a narrative. Like they are very prone to specific storytelling. Okay, yeah, you could say they are. Yeah, so you could say a lot of things about Disney. You could say they're an animation studio or a theme park <coughs> company, an entertainment company, right? But Disney mostly is an intellectual property company. It's what it is. And it's the main focus of their activity is how to create revenue from our intellectual properties. And also, you would probably see it on the news, how to acquire intellectual property. So Disney has bought, for instance, the entire catalog of Fox, and this has provided them with this increasingly bigger source of revenue from series and movies and all the ways these characters that are protected by intellectual property are used. So you cannot draw a Mickey Mouse without, without Disney saying you could. Uh, well, in some, in some cases you could, we'll get to there. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, you could get in trouble for it. You could get in trouble from drawing a Mickey Mouse and posting it on Facebook, for instance. Um, so Disney is an intellectual property company and intellectual or companies that depend on intellectual property a lot have been the main drivers, the main lobbies of um, innovations and control over copyright. You could also talk about 
other areas of intellectual property that are not specifically artistic creations, which is the area that we're here more concerned with, but for instance, pharmaceutical companies um, have been playing a big, big role. And this is especially important for countries that export intellectual property. So besides, um, besides companies or entities with big intellectual property activities wanting innovations in, in, in copyright, also countries who are big intellectual property exporters want innovations in copyright or want to impose their own controls of copyright around the world. So it, you would have, for instance, commercial treaties between developing countries and, and, and European countries would often, um, would often concern intellectual property and impose the same rules of intellectual property in countries that have not been applying them um, in the way that uh, richer countries uh, have. Uh, and this is also, this is also problematic because on one hand you could say this confers protection to artists from these places but on the other hand the ability to not respect in a sense copyright is also very important for the livelihood and existence of, of these countries. You could say for instance there's countries who violate um, copyright from medicines for instance HIV uh, medicine is very expensive and some countries who have, are not signatories of the Berne Convention, for instance, um, don't, don't respect these this copyrights from pharmaceutical companies, which you could argue is a good thing. So this tension is always there. Can yeah, I of course, of course. Uh, about what you're saying that it must be different in different countries and um, that in maybe not so developed countries, you don't really necessarily have copyright mm. in the same extent to what we have in the Western world. This may be more of a bigger question, but do you think that the fact that copyright even exists, do you think it is specific to the capitalistic uh, innovations? Like, uh, uh, one word that popped up for me is colonialization. Like That's very interesting, of course. Like, yeah. um, well, yes, I would say, like, th th we don't have to uh, beat around the bushes. It's obviously connected to uh, capitalist um, <laughs> revenue-making system. It's not only that. So from a lot of stuff that I'm going to say, you would think that I have a very ultra critical position over copyright and I want to annul it and destroy it and everything else. But I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you the, other, the other side of this coin. Yesterday, this is a real, this is a real thing, I can, I can show you this. Yesterday, I went on my phone and Toyota, Portugal, the big, the big uh, car company, they have uh, social networks in Portugal. So to Toyota Portugal shared a video where they use one of my songs. I'm, I'm a musician, as, as I told you. And so this, is, this happened in the past 24 hours. And they have used one of my songs. And this was never discussed. I don't condone having my work used without my authorization. So one day you could wake up, if you're an artist, you could wake up and see that Coca-Cola is using your song for a, for a commercial and they're selling Coca-Cola. They're making a revenue out of it using your work. So they're paying a lot of money to someone who, who's actually advertising and <laughs> not getting anything. <laughs> exactly. So uh, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, yes. I think this is small enough for us to, <laughs> to be able to conversate. But that's not the problem. The it's problem the... Because we are streaming. We are streaming, yeah. okay. So it's important so, for sorry the for the audience then. We'll, we'll try to, <laughs> to be respectful of that. Um, so this is the other side of the issue, right? I, I, copyright is still important, is still beneficial in protecting... 
um, authors from predatory or exploitative practices. So striking a balance here is what it is all about. And there's insane ideas going around uh, over copyright to both ends of the spectrum. So the middle ground is something that I think we're going to discuss actually today with, uh, with Eric and, uh, and Diogo. Uh, I think that's the main focus of the, of, of the talk today. Uh, but striking a balance between protection of authors and freedom and free flow of ideas is very, very difficult. But what you were saying is actually very interesting. Um, this idea that this notion that copyright is a, is a Western notion or a capitalist notion, uh, whereas uh, colonized countries or former colonies or developing countries have other understanding, even philosophical understanding of shared knowledge and that's that's very interesting and you see that a lot with uh, pharmaceutical companies so I, I, I go I, it's a very good example actually using um, traditional myelinia well-known um, medicines from plants and roots and whatever and they're basically making small changes and then copywriting the the um, copywriting the formulations. Sure, Eric, go ahead. Yeah, so I think that's a very important uh, point. And the, the way that happens is you have things that are in the public domain, so mm -hmm. that are uh, not, that within uh, these law systems are not, uh, you cannot, uh, well, copyright them or, or do a, a patent, I think, because it's more in the case of pharmaceutical companies, it's patents. Mm -hmm. So you have something that works and that comes from somewhere, and then the mechanism is, is quite insidious. Like the most in famous example, I think, is like teeth. Mm -hmm. uh, so what will happen is you have uh, you have people that uh, you have a, a, a country where people grow something, and then uh, a company comes and takes these seeds. And uh, of the of the plant, and then engineers a better version of like the crop. Like Monsanto. Like uh, Monsanto is yeah. a famous example. So what they do is they engineer a better version of the crop, uh, and then the people who were farming this crop they are not forced to use this version, but they end up being forced to use it because this ver this Cross version this version works better, and then so now they are out competitive by people in other countries, and then they. Uh, they have to buy. They ha they end up having to buy this version just to be competitive, and so they end up being uh, uh, they end up being in a way subjugated to this uh, Western uh, yeah. company. Yeah. So and this is a, uh, this is definitely a form of neo colonialism. Of course, because entering into this um, uh, into this uh, this is. How do you call it? The the, co the treaties of intellectual property. It's it, it's sort of they're sort of strong armed into um, into accepting these treaties because they're part since the 90s they have been part of the trade treaty. So if you want to sell what you make to other countries, you need a trade treaty. Um, so you want to sell your produce to other countries, and then uh, like the the, the, the U.S. And, and Europe and they, they've been very since the 90s. They've been basically making it uh, a um, a requirement in order to have a trade treaty with us. You're also going to have to sign these intellectual property treaties, and yeah, that's that's the underlying mechanism which really uh, messes things up. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm sad to say that the Netherlands and Belgium, for example, when it comes to uh, potatoes, they're out competing where potatoes are from, and it's uh, and <laughs> so I remember. Uh, uh, the e they've been pressuring the EU to uh, put pressure on Colombia because they've put a tariff on uh, like potato refrigerated potato products that come on a boat all the way from yeah. <laughs> my country yeah. to them, yeah. and <laughs> it's a uh, it's a very nasty. But yeah, that's but that's 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 a very that's a, another part of course of intellectual property. Property. Yeah. What we're talking about. Uh, it's definitely patents. What what you were saying about the pharmaceutical companies. Although we're talking about copyrights, intellectual property. Just to clear uh, these ideas, intellectual property is the broad family, 
and then you have copyright for literary, artistic, and scientific works. We're going to, to see j that just then. And then you have patents and other ways of, of uh, protecting intellectual property for other areas of, of, of acti human activity, like uh, industries, pharmaceutical, etc. cetera. Uh, the Monsanto thing, also not only in the relations between, between uh, different countries, but there's very specific examples of um, within communities, communities being destroyed, um, like agricultural communities, because one of the one or two of the of the crops of the of the people doing uh, doing agricultural crops um, acceded to to these seeds, and then birds might contaminate crops, and then the people who are not using the Monsanto seeds suddenly find themselves using without, you know, without purpose. And Monsanto would, would sue them for, for this. So it's very, very complicated and community destructing issue. So a very, very fair point. Um, you also mentioned something which was copyright is different from country to country when you were making your point. Well, technically, yes, but um, it's been heavily harmonized. So this economic, economic aspect of, um, of copyright means that, well, maybe intellectual property is a very tradable kind of area. And as in, Trade, trade has been globalized, it's important that you can expect the same protection here and there uh, for goods and for intellectual property as well. So sin since the late 19th century, um, countries have been establishing bilateral and multilateral agreements regarding intellectual property and copyright uh, specifically. One of the most important uh, treaties is the Berne Convention from the late 19th century, but that's been, um, that's been updated from time to time during the 20th century. Uh, so currently the Berne Convention has been ratified by 173 countries out of, I don't know, 193, I think, from the UN. Um, and this means that while each country has its own take, the way they, they, they interpret this convention in their own legal systems, copyright is profoundly harmonized internationally. You could argue that the main, still the main differences are between these two philosophies of copyright, the droit d'auteur, and, uh, and uh, copyright, per se, you know, the continental European perspective of it and the uh, common law UK and US perspective. But even, I, it, even in those areas, it's only specific, specific, uh, specific questions that really set them apart and they, they're mostly harmonized in ways that, that we're going to, to understand later. So, I have given you this brief, brief history of how, 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 how did it come, how did it come to this, really, actually. And for me, it was very helpful to understand this, this idea, the very first copyright, um, copyright mechanisms, the idea that works used to be very arduous to reproduce, so there was no economic interest in the, in the, in the, um, in the selling, the reproduction and selling of, of intellectual works and artists would often depend on, um, uh, well, mecenas, on, um, oh, shit, sorry, my English is <laughs> escaping me here for a second. Patron, People who, patrons, patrons, patron. yeah. <laughs> so artists would, would often depend on patrons and for the first technological, um, innovations that allowed reproduction in an easy and fast way really um, brought to light the economic potential of intellectual works and this economic interest basically provided the basis for um, the establishment of protections. So we've said a ton of words, copyright, 
this copyright, that. <laughs> so what does copyright really protect? So we've talked about the Berne Convention and that's always a good starting point for definitions and for understanding what uh, contemporary um, copyright is. So according to the Berne Convention, copyright protects every production in the literary, scientific and artistic domain, whatever may be the mode or form of its expression. Again, we are going to need to take a step back and, and analyze um, in a more colloquial way, maybe each of these terms. So, so, so that you know, in the Portuguese copyright law, the expression is ipsis verbis. It's is almost exactly the same. Uh, if you open the, the the first page of the Portuguese copyright law, it states what is protected, and it's almost exactly like this: literary, scientific, and art works from literary, scientific, and artistic domain, whatever may be the form of its expression. So this gives us fairly good clues on what kind of intellectual creations are protected by copyright. So now I pose the question, the cheeky question. Can an idea be protected? And I'm really asking you. <laughs> I don't think so. I think a method to achieve or to make tangible an idea could be protected. An idea, I think, will be tough to do. Tough. All right. That's a tough. fair, yeah, fair tough. point. Yeah. <laughs> it, it often comes down to toughness. How can I prove that it is copyrightable? <laughs> what else? Do we have more, more opinions? Don't, don't feel pressure to talk, please. If you, if you want to, go ahead. Okay. So, uh, the first thing I thought is that are things that seem like they could, ideas that seem that, uh, of course, this is an idea by someone, it could be co uh, but others that, uh, it's that are obviously everyone's, like, you could argue that the first four bars of uh, Bach's uh, choral, I don't know, would be hymns, uh, but uh, a soup, a carrot soup. Is, can anyone own a carrot soup or something like that? You mean, a yeah. reci you mean the recipe for... Uh, the oh, re I'm going to pose that question as well. <laughs> no, I want to hear it. <laughs> so, ideas, right? They, it's, it seems very simple to answer and it sort of actually is no even if it is a good idea <laughs> ideas belong to everybody and it's easier maybe to express this idea <laughs> through an example so imagine newton sitting under the tree and watching the apple fall and it suddenly has this brilliant idea about gravity right so he states that, he tells his friend, you know, I just had the craziest idea about gravity. Do you know what, you want to know what gravity is? And, but and suddenly this idea has been communicated. This is actually how textbook, um, copyright uh, textbooks state. Once an idea is communicated, it belongs to humanity. <laughs> so ideas cannot be copyrighted. But then Newton went home and he wanted to spread this new idea, right? So he wrote his scientific thesis. Uh, he wrote scientific articles that expressed this idea in his own words. So these articles are scientific works that are protected by copyright. I think this is a fair, you, you're getting, you're, you're getting what, I'm, what I'm at, right? I think this is a fairly good, um, Example, so you might have you might have had this brilliant idea uh, But on the other hand The thing that's actually protected is the way in, he, in which he has Expressed this idea through his scientific articles. So no gravity is not copyrightable obviously, but writing a text about it 
is the text is copyrightable. Okay? Um, so, I also have another cheeky question for you, which is, can a phone book be protected under copyright? What do you exactly mean by a phone book? Because like an old school, I mean, I know it's 2023. We have all the contacts and addresses yeah. from people. Yeah. What actually, the content of the phone book, the actual um, numbers of people and addresses, it's that where we're trying to protect that's a, that's a That's an interesting question. But I mean, in general terms, the phone book, the work, the... the, the I don't think so. Yeah. And, but can we know well, why? Uh, why do because you, you don't own the, the content. You don't own the, the phone number, you don't own the, the addresses, I don't, you don't own the names. Mm. Um, that's my guess, I don't know. To copyright the, the name. <laughs> generate the phone numbers own them. <laughs> so the companies that generate the phone, well, that's, a <laughs> that's an interesting point. We, we can't protect the content, but we can protect the design and all the... If it is like a yellow pages thing, right? We're talking about, so... That's also a very fair point. So yeah, so... Making a book has a lot of aspects <coughs> to it. You mentioned a very good one, which is design, right? So this, this book does not have one author, it has many authors, <laughs> actually. Uh, because there's people who have designed uh, the, the, the front and there's people... Well, that's a, a discussion for later, but coming back to the phone book. Well, some, some things are not worth copywriting. <laughs> so facts, themes, theories and ideas, we've, we've said that. Everyday objects, simple shapes, none of this is protected. Because there are conditions to what can constitute a work protected under copyright. But fun books, I ask specifically because there's a very famous case, Feist publica the Feist publication case. So uh, Feist publications was a, a big um, state level phone book publisher. And uh, a rural, it, it was literally called rural um, rural Telephone Company, I think was the name, uh, published a local phone book copying the contents from this Fast Publications phone book for that specific area. And you might wonder, because, you know, how can phone books, how can you tell that a phone book was copied? Well, because Fast Publications did something tricky, which was to include fake names and phone numbers within the publication that would let them know if someone has copied it. So they checked and they were like, okay, this is, they, they used, our, our, they used our, our phone book. So Fast Publications took them to court and they actually lost the suit, specifically because um, the court stated exactly this, that these facts, uh, these facts cannot be copyrightable unless they are organized in a curatorial sort of way, let's say. So if I make a list, if, if, I, if there's a, 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 if I only made a phone book, for instance, I curated a phone book where I state um, or rather, let's, let's say another different thing. If I make a list of my favorite uh, movies from the 1920s, that is copyrightable, maybe, but that is, <laughs> that is copyrightable. But an integral list of all the movies made in the 1920s is not. That's just, a, that's just factual, okay? Yes. So imagine, okay, we can imagine because it, it's true. Um, I've spent a lot of time, me and my wife, um, going uh, door to door in Porto, trying to know who was actually uh, manufacturing things uh, within the city center. Hmm. So we compiled this 
huge list of contacts. It, it is a phone book, actually. Yeah. But it took like more than one year of daily work of five people doing that for free. So <laughs> we share that this knowledge for free with everyone. That's but I would be really annoyed if, if someone tried to publish this. And you know, one of the main arguments of fast publication was to win the, the court case. It took a uh, fucking long time to yeah, make this one. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> it, it really, took really a lot hard of work, hard yeah. work. But alphabetically or geographically organizing the totality of people living there and their phone numbers, the court didn't, didn't consider that uh, copyrightable. Although what you're saying is a bit different and it's more towards what I was, what I was expressing regarding the favorite movies list, for instance. Sure. Um, yeah, so it, it's a really interesting point. Um, and, but I think it boils down to that copyright is supposed to protect like, creative work. Um, You're anticipating. Oh, sorry, this. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, shit. I, I didn't want to get. I didn't want to get. Uh, I'm, I, I, uh, disculpe. But um, uh, uh, but this interesting what you say about labor because there's labor involved and of mm. course every every time there's labor involved there is a a, 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 a pressure and also an ethical need maybe to yeah. make sure that this labor can be uh, protected. protected. And so I also think there is you see. Um, uh, when there is some kind of intellectual labor that is not protected by copyright, there is always going to be also a pressure to create then extra legal measures that can protect it. And then it depends a bit on how good is the lobby of the people performing this labor, mm -hmm. if this will happen. And in I don't know the situation in Portugal, but I know that in... Um, I think that there are uh, many countries that have some kind of protection for... Uh, uh, databases, so co collections of, of facts which are not really uh, protected by copyright. So sometimes something is not protected by copyright, but then other things pop up. And another example is um, of something that's a lot of hard work, but that's not copyrightable if you make a, a certain... And maybe I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the example after, because if it popped up already <laughs> in the presentation, then... Uh, I, I'm going to, like, at the end of this, at the end of this part, I'm going to pose another one of my cheeky questions, uh, which is going to be related to, to all of this. And we'll, we can come back uh, yeah, to we'll this. Yeah, we can come back. And we can, we can make a break then after, after that, that discussion. But thank you. Thank you very much for your, for your intervention. So I was saying there are conditions to what can constitute a work protected under copyright. Uh, and it basically boils down to two main things. First of all, express yourself. So intellectual creations cannot remain in the world of ideas. Uh, the idea cannot remain a private matter. It needs to take shape, to be externalized by whatever mode. So externalizing. I have this abstract idea that came down from, from the sky, right? And suddenly I express it. I sing a song, a song or write a poem. I it, it, it comes from my mind and then out into the world. So this is the first uh, criteria. It has to be externalized. But one uh, very, very, very key information about this is that expressing is not the same as publishing. Okay? So I have written... Uh, a poem. I have written the best poem in the <laughs> this year, and I love it so much. But I don't think it's still it's it's got to rest a little bit. I get I have to give it a rest <laughs> before I put it out into the public. So I put it in my drawer, and and lock it. Is this poem not protected under copyright because it's not been divulged because it's not been broadcasted per se? Of course it is protected. It's been expressed. It's been materialized in some way. In this, in this case, it has even been materialized in a, in a physical uh, way. Thank you. Sorry. To, if, can I interrupt you Go ahead. You with of, a course, question? of course. Of uh, course. I thought about this uh, a few times, mm. that uh, you have an idea and maybe you write it down or you send someone an email or let's say 
But then shortly after, you see it popping up, like a company who is uh, already selling the idea that you had. Hmm. And, and I think this is also uh, the case with, was it the light bulb or something? Hmm. That there were uh, people had similar ideas hmm. on completely different places of the world. Yeah. How well, how would this? If we're talking specifically about the uh, light bulb, the light bulb would be protected probably under uh, a patent. Uh, so it it all boils down to whoever registers uh, the patent first. But even like in the case of light bulb specifically, you might be able to patent some aspects of it, but not all of it. For instance, the aspect you might not be able to patent the aspect of something giving light you might just be able to patent the way what happens technologically to to give that light sure. so what you were saying before the, i had this idea but then i saw that someone else got there first well you know this is this is the thing you <laughs> Ideas are not uh, are not copyrightable, and um, express the expression of these ideas is what constitutes um, the, the the work that is copyrightable. And we, we we're going to talk later uh, today about um, when does this protection start, and in, in what mode. And there's a lot of myths rega regarding registers. And so we're going to touch upon that, I believe. So expressing is not publishing. You don't have to make it available to the public to be protected under, under copyright. You just have to express this idea in some way. But all kinds of expression? Well. No, for an intellectual creation to be protected, it must be creative in nature. Thank you, Eric. For <laughs> it's, uh, it must be creative in nature. It must be an expression that results from creative choices made by an author. But listen, we are entering a very subjective area here. What is a, a creative what is something that's creative in nature? What are creative choices? So I pose to you the question, is quality, artistic quality, something that should be considered when discussing the copyright of a work? Or merit, quality or merit? We have someone back there. Uh, for me, maybe not in terms of in quality. I was thinking more traditional versus independent author, or traditional music versus uh, s s one person writing his idea inspired on his life, hmm. on opposed to the music that already was there for ages that you cannot really own. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't know. It's kind of two, two two types of cr creativity. One, it's the creativity that already exists, and the other, it's an author's creativity, and that could be protected because it's. That you're person. you're making a very a very very interesting point, and I think this is this is also going to be this is a good time for for discussing this as well. But what you're saying is. And it touches upon the idea of authorship and our, our contemporary ideas of authorship. So, but for instance, should oral tradition, should oral tradition works be copyrightable, for instance? And forget about, we're going to talk about how long does copyright last, but forget, forget about that. But should, should uh, oral tradition be copyrightable is a, is a very fair question. Technically, Technically, not for reasons related also to the to to public domain characteristics, um, but the 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 question I asked about uh, 
asked about uh, quality. You said you don't think quality matters, right? And I think that's a very... <laughs> I think the question to every single But thing. also, what is creativity? Oh, so completely. these are all, you know, if you're a judge, if you're a judge and you're called to decide if something's protected under copyright and you have to decide if something's creative or not, that's, it's as, as problematic as deciding if some, something must have quality or not, artistic quality or not. So they're all very broad I, I terms. Think quali you, you can't actually protect quality. That, that's not the criteria, actually. Can be novelty, but what's what's novelty? Novelty like? as a what, is what a is novelty in music? Because okay, everything is like a mix of influences. <laughs> so probably you are protecting uh, a set of of things, not mm. a, a single issue like the quality or the novelty. Uh, you see, like jazz yeah. musicians, they they are probably yeah. mixing everything from everyone, all the influences and all the traditional and all the modern, and but you, you still can protect it. So. In Portuguese legal, just to, to answer the, the quality aspect of it, no, quality, artistic quality, is not an important aspect when determining whether a work should be copyrighted or not. Um, novelty, on the other hand, has something to do with the, in our, or in, in the Portuguese at least, legal, legal tradition, Creativity is very connected to this idea of novelty. Novelty in the way that if, in the way that the work that's being created must be, um, must propose something that is, that has, has, hasn't been proposed in the exact same way before which is different from individuality. Individuality is when you can determine the identity of the author from a work. You can make a work that's very much uh, the same uh, as, you know, if you make a, an impressionist landscaping painting, there's hundreds and hundreds of impressionist landscape paintings. Individuality setting yourself apart as an author is not important. It, the important part here is actually novelty, really, for the, for the there's, there must be a, a modicum of creativity, is what usually is said. So it must be, it must result from free creative choices. And this modicum is, is an indeterminate concept, really. But it's very, very, very permissive, let's say. <laughs> very, very permissive. Uh, in, formerly, in copyright countries, they would tell you, in the US, they would tell you, if someone wants to copy it, then it's worth protecting. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a very more straightforward approach to it. If someone wants to copy it, then if, if it's worth copying, it's worth protecting. Okay. So over here in in trois d'autor <laughs> kind of countries, expression and creativity are the two the two um, basic criteria. So. To be protected, the work needs nothing else. Subjective artistic quality and individuality are not, are not required. Um, so with this in mind, what we have discussed here, I wanted to ask another question and then maybe we can take a little break, discuss a little and take a little break. I think. Uh, I think you want to, to and, and maybe pose also some questions of your own. So I wanted to ask you, now, can a recipe be protected? Someone mentioned carrot soup. That was, <laughs> that was foresight. So maybe uh, my idea is if it is a really simple recipe, maybe not. If it is a really complex, precise, specific recipe, maybe yes, even... This, I would say no. Well, <laughs> I would you know, uh, suprematist painters would disagree with you. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> like Rothko would also disagree with you. <laughs> you could argue that those are very, very simple 
works to paint a canvas in black or in or Klein blue or uh, so should we I think what you're saying is also a bit connected to in a way to considering artistic quality right so a, a simple work can be protected a complex one Sorry, because I don't think it's so much like Miro or a surrealist painter uh, would, me, would be more owning a color or owning um, a texture. You, uh, no, that's not that's not what I mean. That I don't mean. Okay. I don't mean the color blue itself. I mean the 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 painting, the, so the that expression. Okay. But it, th that's what I mean by recipe of a carrot soup. It it isn't the painting. It's just the color. Uh, the painting it's you eating the soup you <laughs> uh, liking it y the the flavor that's the painting but <laughs> the carrot soup it's i don't know I, I, you're you're going you're going to uh, you're going through a good analogy there i like it <laughs> i think it's interesting i i don't think it can uh, because if it could be protected, most of the recipes, industrial recipes, would be like copyrighted or having patents. I don't think they are, right? I think they are like they are secrets, but they are not actually protected by law, are they? So, like a really good wine, can you protect a really good wine? <laughs> but as a recipe, well, you should. You should put it yeah, on yeah. a refrigerator <laughs> and yeah, only you know, open I can it. Protect my wine. <laughs> only <laughs> open it in a very <laughs> from guys like you. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> can actually the winemaker protect his uh, his property? <laughs> So you're, what you're saying is, oh, go, go ahead, Ugo. Uh, I don't know, an idea is that you can't protect the food itself. Like I, if I have the recipe, if I read it on a magazine, I can prepare it like this food without having to pay copyright to anyone. But the, the actual written recipe uh, is creative uh, content. Uh, okay. So the, the actual That's written recipe point. or recorded recipe or whatever uh, medium you you are producing expressing it at, I think it's it That's can. a fair point. You can have, you can have your take. If you can have your take on the recipe and then republish it, right? Like your being have yours. Have you ever researched a recipe online and come across one of those recipe blogs and you would see how they add this? Three paragraph long introduction <laughs> to to the recipe before they actually get to the ingredients list and the instructions part. So, yeah, recipes, the food, the way you prepare food cannot be copyrighted. Okay, I cannot own a horse I would I would love to. I would make a lot of money <laughs> from being the only one <laughs> that could produce a horse Eric, it's a it's a very non-vegetarian food from the north of Portugal. <laughs> um, but I can write the way in which I prepare my arroz de and do it in a way that is protected. That's why you have, well, recipe books from Jamie Oliver and yeah. from all these, all these cooks. But it must contain a modicum a creativity. It cannot be just stating ingredients and instructions. That is not worthy, <laughs> worthy being the key word here, <laughs> worthy of protection. And Go ahead. And the plate eater. Okay. Sorry? Okay. okay, we are talking about the recipe, mm -hmm. but in those books you have photos too, the plating and everything. Oh, wow, that's, yeah. a, that's a different, uh, so the copyright if you, if you for the if photograph yeah. would, would belong, in this case, to the photographer and not to the cook who, <laughs> who actually made the food. Mm, that is interesting. Yeah. But if I have a, a restaurant and I, ju I copy just the, the plating and everything, just like a three-star Michelin dish or something, yeah. I will not be sued. I'm going to tell you a story about a photograph that's a very funny photograph. Maybe I can find it online. So this is the photograph. I'm going to try to maybe push it over here. OK, can you see this? Have you ever seen this oasis? 
Oasis album cover. So this cover from, from this record by Oasis is, is a photograph of the band members and then there's some objects distributed through this pool and this house. And Oasis were really big at this time. They were huge. And I think a Sunday Telegraph reporter discovered um, they were shooting something. He didn't know exactly what, but they were shooting something. And so he followed him around and he found out they were shooting the cover for their next record. So he rented a room in a hotel right in front, <laughs> right in front of this area. And he shot it. And the Sunday, the Sunday Times or Sunday Telegraph, I don't remember, posted the, the, um, the picture. This is going, this is the shoot, this is going to be the next cover for an Oasis, <laughs> Oasis album. So what, what did Oasis do? Noel Gallagher actually was in charge, I think it was Noel, in charge of making this distribution of this, of this object. So he sued um, the, the newspaper and, um, and the photographer who took the picture saying that they had, they had violated his copyright over his work, his artistic work. Um, what do you think happened? He lost. I would say he won. He Actually, he lost. <laughs> but it's a very, 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 very um, debatable thing. So the judge in this case understood that the random um, allotment of objects was not enough to be worthy of copyright. So you would get this sometimes. You would get judges having to make calls, very debatable calls, on what does merit, what does meet this modicum of creativity, right? Uh, but do you know who could have won this? <laughs> You know who could have won this? The photography, the photographer who actually shot this photography for the album cover. Because he owns the copyright of the photography itself as a work of art. Sorry, you, you wanted to talk, yes. It's just that, that the argument that was randomly placed objects, it's not random. Well, it's not only the photographer, but also the creative work of placing those objects. I tend, to, I tend to agree uh, with you. Eric, Eric was very skeptical. I mentioned mm -hmm. he probably <laughs> won. But yeah, because you, you would assume that this, this disposition of objects is a creative work. That was not the understanding of the, of the judge at the time. Um, but anyway, because you mentioned the the photography in a book, and it reminded me of this, because you could, cooks now argue that their fine dining creations should be protected under copyright law. And they're not, basically. Um, and they have, so recipes have become a, a basically a trade secret, because they're not uh, copyrightable. And cooks working in fine dining uh, restaurants go to extreme lengths to protect this, this, uh, this, their creations. And also, there are um, there's sort, sort of this tacit agreement when you're a cook and you're creating something for a restaurant, um, the restaurant owns that that creation. This is not in any way. This is sometimes established in, in legal contracts, but there's, it's also sort of this gentleman's agreement in the, in the cook's world, at least from my experience talking to, to cooks about this, uh, this uh, phenomenon, it's, it's what I, I got. You could argue that, I mean, uh, you, uh, you've probably seen that Netflix series Chef's Table. I mean, there's cooks working with insanely creative uh, ideas and you could argue there's, there should, maybe cooks one day are going to make a fairly strong lobby to protect their, their creations as well. 
um, but they are not uh, copyrightable. But yes, the text explaining the recipe can be copyrightable if it meets this modicum of, of creativity. Um, so I think this is a, a good point maybe to make a, a small a small break, uh, and if maybe you want to discuss this a little bit, or maybe we can come back and start a new discussion over it. Um, Go ahead. I have, um, it's a bit side note, but related to what you're showing right mm -hmm. now. Um, so uh, we are live streaming uh, this session, yeah, and we are recording it. And um, oh, we're absolutely breaking. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Like this is what we have been trying to <laughs> to figure out. How about when speakers want to show? Well, uh, you, like this. I could like I, I, if I put my <laughs> lawyer's robes. If I put my lawyer's robes on, we could discuss limitations. We are going to talk about it actually. Limitations of copyright, and now we could argue basically that this is. A uh, work or a fragment of a work being divulged in the context of education and, and critical analysis. And that is an area that's protected. But you always go at these things, you have to always go at these things in good faith. And also, mm -hmm. also, even if I think the law is protecting me, someone might disagree and might sue me. Okay? So the fact that I think that I'm showing this work in the context of education and I'm totally protected by that idea doesn't mean that Noel Gallagher might see this <laughs> and might actually sue me and then I'll have to, I'll have, a judge will have to understand if, if I am under this protection or not. So it's, it's such a gray, it seems like such a... It's not, it's not as, it's not as gray, some things are, I think, yeah, but it's, uh, there's a lot of jurisprudence as well. So there's a lot of past decisions that inform current understanding of copy law as well. Um, and tendentially, they have been very restrictive, I think. But that's my opinion. Small break? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so what I propose now, we've got around an hour, 45 minutes, an hour. Um, so what I propose now is we've seen the what, and we should now start looking into the who <laughs> and into the how as well, <laughs> and the for how long. <laughs> um, so what can be protected? We've, we've answered that or we, we tried to, we've tried to answer that and we have seen it's not super clear cut. There's uh, definitions that help us understand what merits protection under copyright. Um, but a different question that one might pose is who does copyright protect? So we've been mentioning author. So the, the basic idea and uh, the romantic, I would say, idea about intellectual creations is the author, this one genius toiling away, creating these wonderful works of art. But more often than not, this is not the case or not exclusively um, the case. So who does copyright protect? Generally speaking, copyright, yes, is attributed to the author, the intellectual creator of a work. Uh, and who is, what is this intellectual creator of a work? It's the person who expressed, as we have seen, a creative work of literary, scientific, or artistic no uh, nature, this person is the older of copyright over it, but this is not always the case. An older of the copyright or owner, if you prefer a more property um, related language, owner of copyright is a very important concept. Um, 
I'm sure uh, you all have heard cases of artists not owning uh, copyright. Uh, a lot of times what, what they're referring to is not actually their copyright over a work, might be one of the related uh, rights like the master. For instance, Taylor Swift doesn't own her master, her masters, but she owns the copyright of her songs. I don't know if you're aware of this situation with Taylor Swift recently, but she'd made a very bold move and a very interesting move related to intellectual property. So Taylor Swift is a very famous artist who has, she apparently writes a lot of, of her songs, which is great, and it's not always the case with, with performing artists. Um, but she, she has a big repertoire and she's the, the copyright holder of her works, of her songs. Uh, but she has recorded, and we're going to talk about this regarding related rights, she has recorded uh, these songs through um, phonographic companies, through, through publishers, right? Uh, who then own that specific fixation of that work, that master, the master of that work. And they came into a disagreement and she cannot, um, she cannot use those masters as she intends to. So if she, if she wants to republish them in any way or collect them and do a big compilation, she cannot do it. So what she decided to do is, yes, I don't own this specific fixation of, of my uh, performance of this work of art that I own, but I can perform it in any other way and record it. So she re-recorded her entire repertoire which is very, very interesting. She re-recorded it and released it, now owning those specific masters. It's an uh, interesting case. Are you Are aware of this, uh, Eric? You've read about it, yeah? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and it's, what's really uh, fascinating is that it really uh, mirrors uh, what happened to Prince with mm. Warner, and uh, he, he threatened to do this. He was like, I'm going to re-record everything <laughs> to the note and then I think because he was, he, I mean, he never got around to doing it also because he was writing so many new songs yeah, all the yeah. time that he was like, it's a commitment. <laughs> and, um, and I think maybe also Def Leppard did this. Wow, um, really? I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. And, and it's fascinating because it's a lot of musicians have made this, 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 um, this, this, uh, had this idea over, over the years because it's not, Taylor Swift is not the first person to have a conflict. And maybe Def Leppard did it before uh, Taylor Swift, but at least he's the very first really high profile f f uh, artist to do it. So it's fascinating to see it actually happen. And it's also the curious thing now, of course, is like, what are the fans going to do? Somebody who wants to listen to a famous song of her will have to make a conscious effort when they type it in, in like Spotify, which I guess is how most people listen to music today, to choose her version. Or, or the or the original, and will they feel sentimentally attached to the original, or will they be like, no, I'm a Swifty, I want to make sure that Sailor. <laughs> so it's, I mean, I think it's a fascinating experiment, and and also from an artistic perspective, it's super like, <coughs> I don't know, like making a record, like so many things come together. So it would be, a st and she is no longer the person she was when she recorded that. So how was that for her to do that? Like, I think it's an, a, s a fascinating um, uh, a performance.
put a capital lock on the whole thing. Do you think we should just go on up? Well, mostly she's uh, she's very rich, <laughs> so she can hire producers and musicians. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you can you can reproduce if if you're recording on very very big budget professional studios, you can reproduce uh, a record to a certain degree, to a very precise degree. The, I, I think the most unprecise aspect of it might be actually the human rendition, so or, or vocal performances or the drummer's performance. But uh, if, you, if you record in a very professional studio, they, would me they will measure the tape uh, with a tape the distance between a microphone and the amplifier or uh, where the drums were set in the room so and, and this is something they inherited from the times where you would record on tape because recording on tape if, if there was a mistake, if there was something wrong, you would have to revisit that and be able to reproduce exactly what was going on. You couldn't edit it so easily uh, like with digital information. So there's actually books with uh, Abbey Road recordings by the Beatles and other, or other artists. There's entire books with just the engineering of how it was recorded, like to the how many centimeters the fader of the guitar was up or the <laughs> it's very very scientific so in a way you could reproduce almost with with a lot of authenticity yeah but that we, we are talking about the sound that you're getting from but yeah. i was talking about the probably the more creative side like of course the, that, that's the, what the, i was saying so the, the human aspect arrangements and everything no, the, the arrangements you can do it. You can reproduce the, yeah, the arrangements. It's not. Uh, did, she will have to give the credits to the guys yeah. who made it, right? Definitely, definitely. <laughs> of course, okay, yes. Of course, yeah. Okay. The only thing that she she wanted was like the to be, to, to have to, the, to the, own her masters. The masters. Okay. Yeah. Take it take it from the, the yeah. label, the, the record label. Yeah. And, and okay. So. What you were saying was, basically, she, working on this, generated a lot of rights, a lot of related rights as well. But she, she, do, she doesn't intend to keep those for herself as well. Otherwise, she would have to do her, herself all the, all the parts, you know? She couldn't have guest musicians or producers or whatever. Yeah, if she wanted 100%. There's two kinds of uh, neighboring rights, right? The master and the... There's actually three kinds of, of neighboring rights, but two that that we should, that really <laughs> matter. <Okay. laughs> but yes, we're, we're going to talk about really okay. at, at the beginning of this afternoon. Sorry. Uh, um, so, but the, the the new versions, the new renditions, couldn't be very similar because otherwise it will be uh, infringing the original masters, and the algorithms need to understand that there's a difference. For example, Shazam needs to detect which one is the original one and which one is the new rendition. So how does it, that work? Um, it has to be a completely different version, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it's probably no, it doesn't, it doesn't need to be a, a, a completely different version. The, the thing is, you would... You would so At some extent, it has to, to, to have changes. It will never, never, ever be for sure, exactly for sure. the same. Specifically, sure. you're talking about technologically uh, detecting, I mean, the sound waves will yeah, never yeah, for be sure. absolutely for sure. identical. For sure. So yeah. in terms of technolo technological um, 
technological she basis says, for this. It. It's absolutely yeah. covered. Okay. One thing, one thing that you mentioned, which is funny, is like if you if you reproduce it absolutely to a to a point where imagine even the even the even Shazam would be yeah. would be confused. Would she be infringing? Uh, the the other master. Yeah. I don't think so. I don't okay. think so. That that was a specific uh, fixation. This is another one. They're just they're just okay. done to a point. Okay. But Eric, what's the what's the talk? Yeah, I think I have an, an interesting example that goes along with this because um, so you have this difference between the master recording and like the the composition, mm -hmm. and um, often it's it it like if you own the, if you're the copyright holder of the composition, then you need to re-record it but it's also when getting permission to use the song it's often easier to get permission to use the song than to get permission to use the song and the master, master recording for example you want to use it like in your example in uh in a for a com radio commercial yeah. uh, or a tv commercial because um for the uh composition often it passes it, it it's easier to get the permission so where there's a whole industry of people who make recordings of that course. sound exactly, exactly. alike so um because then then it sounds because of course you want the original recording because it's that's what triggers the emotional response so i once had an sometimes interview sometimes it's unattainable yeah so and then you cannot and so i've read there was i've read an interview once with a with a with a musician sound slash sound engineer like for example they wanted to use a hendrix song and then he just was really good at re reproducing the tones um, yeah, so maybe there was some original neighboring rights of, a, of an engineer who made creative choices, but that seems to be a bit, in the jurisprudence, a bit lost. Yeah. Uh, they, they don't seem to be so well protected. <laughs> and um, there's a very interesting uh, example of this with uh, uh, Tom Waits, where uh, Tom Waits <coughs> doesn't want his songs to be used in commercials. And then they did this, so they they um, they hired they hired, they, uh, they hired somebody who sounds like Tom Waits, mm -hmm. and then Tom Waits got, got around to he won the suit not because of uh, neighboring rights or copyright, but he used his personality rights. So they're saying like you, and that's the, as a, a, a different set of rights. So he said you're basically like you're pretending to be me, and <laughs> so it makes it seem as if I agreed, and 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 that's how he won that case. But so it's interesting that there's there was there is a really this tradition of making songs sound like uh, other songs, but from uh, with another goal, <laughs> Taylor's goal. <laughs> Actually, about the Tom Waits case, we discussed um, in another master class. Ah, actually, yeah. so funny. Um, but uh, this personality rights, you said, it went under vi this? I, I think so, maybe. Uh, yeah, it maybe I, I if I recall, it was exactly, exactly but that. But it's not uh, the only instance, actually, of, of that happening. I think Madonna went through something very similar, which is a very Madonna thing to do. But <laughs> 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 but then this, well, it's not directly linked to personality rights, but mm. wouldn't the Oasis case, for me it would make sense that uh, the Oasis case could have also have been protected under the similar rights. If so, like uh, George was saying before, it's still Noel Gallagher and the Oasis gang were planning this, someone just went there to take a photo. So. It, well, yeah. it it couldn't be linked to personality rights in that in that case specifically. I mean that the the it's, it's you would have to, to to try to emulate the personality of the person. Mm. I would say, sure, and sure. it's a different. This is a different exterior aspect. Yeah. To to that, uh, so I think I think he was going with the right idea actually the fact that it took a creative input from him to to do that work and then having it photographed and reproduced without his authorization was eventually breaching his copyright over that that work so i think he went with the right idea although it didn't it didn't work out the way he, he intended actually but also, you mentioned before about your personal uh, yeah. case within the last 24 hours. <laughs> it's still developing. <laughs> so I if did. You share that, yeah. But we can actually discuss that. I think it's funny. Like, 
in a very non-legal way, in a practical way, what do you do in situations like this? So something that is really advisable to do is always um, do something in do things in good faith and in a non non-hostile matter. Well, mostly because. Uh, people are not really well informed about intellectual property and copyright. And you could argue, and this, is, this happens a lot, companies using up-and-coming artists' works, for instance, and then being very surprised that they're mad about it because supposedly they were giving him a, a platform for him or her, a platform for, for promotion. And that's all very fair, of course, but you can give someone a platform for promote, yeah. promoting themselves and ask their permission first. <laughs> so one thing, the first thing you have to do is, I'm sorry, you're breaching, you're breaching my rights and, well, decide immediately what you want to do. If you don't want them to use it at all, please take it down. If you want to discuss a way in which they can use it and they can uh, reimburse you for using it, well, you can open this negotiation negotiating channel. I mean, this is very much a case-to-case -case then situation. Uh, but, and we're going to talk about SUS and criminal protection for copyright later, so I'll save, I'll save the rest for, for that. Yeah. I think you are independent, right? You don't have like a Right now, uh, yes. Yeah, so they don't have a label advocating for your rights or yeah. their rights. Right? So it's very unfair, actually. <laughs> it's like having people working for you for free, saying that they will get experience and then they will get visibility. Yeah. Exactly the same thing. Like these agencies, they earn a lot of money with yeah. this. So I don't think like they know what they are doing, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> they know exactly what they are doing. That's my opinion. I, sometimes it's trickier than that. There's a lot of moving pieces involved. I, I worked w in a case with an artist that uh, saw his song on, on Facebook being used in a, a publicity for a shoe company. And what happened was this shoe company was going to have a, um, was going to have a meeting, a private meeting, and they wanted to show new products and they made a video wanted to, 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 do, to use some music for the video. And you could argue if this is private use or not, whatever, but it was still a very controlled situation. But then things got out of hand because they enjoyed the music video a lot. Um, and so they started to promoting the video within their company's um, TV channel. So the, the company had like TVs spread out throughout the offices and the, the video would keep running and, and the, the song would keep playing. And then someone from the communications team thought the video was so cool, they should just post it online. <laughs> so they did. So you see how this is not always a very conscious decision and there's a lot of misinformation. And actually we wrote to, we wrote them to, 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 to that company and their lawyer responded with, uh, oops, our mistake, very sorry, we'll take it down. And um, that's not what we were asking at the time, we were asking for a compensation for having uh, had a publicity for this company for, for free, basically. And we eventually won the, the court case. It took a long time, but we won the, the court case. It was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just want to point out that um, I've worked in advertising for a long time, mm -hmm. and that's, uh, uh, there's a lot of abuse when it comes to of copywriting. Course. Of course. It's like insane. And we can't blame just the agency. Sometimes the brand is, is the culprit. Yes. So they, they share both. Some. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't get into the details, but but we shouldn't blame just the advertising agency. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's a, there's a lot of moving pieces and misinformation. Things happen really fast sometimes, but but yeah, definitely when you're working with creative um, stuff, the f and you want to use other people's works, the first thing you should do is ask permission to use 
that work. Sometimes it's a handful, but you really have to do it. I think the problem is the misunderstanding of sync. Yeah. In this, ca in this case, uh, or how can you use uh, all rights uh, you have for using uh, uh, music, um, commercials, movies, or whatever. And um, sometimes in advertising, people don't 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 think that. Music should have its own compensations for what they are doing, musicians or whatever. And they say, okay, this is free, I can use it or not, or they just take yeah. it be, and think that, okay, it's okay, it's, 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 it's free for us, but it's not. Yeah, and you know, coming from a company that, in the, in the case of the shoe company, coming from a company that was very protective of their own designs, <laughs> shoe designs they should have known a little bit better that, uh, that intellectual property is, uh, is important. But, well, um, I'm getting sidetracked here, so I'm going to go back to what, what I was saying. So, no, not always the, the author is the person who's older of copyright. So a lot, a lot, a lot of works are actually done not by one single illuminated author, but it takes a village, really. Very often work is a result of several acts of creation done by several people. So these people become co-authors. And if you want to, to use a work uh, that's been co-authored, you must get authorization by all the co-authors. Co and they will share the revenues that result from this work. How will they share uh, the revenues? Well, in Portuguese, in Portuguese law, unless it's stated on paper how the shares of co-propriety uh, are divided, they're considered divided um, equally, okay? So, you, we will talk about SPA later, but when registering a song with SPA, one of the things that you can do on their platform is determine the percentage of, of revenue that's owed to you from whatever uses are, are done with that uh, song, for instance. So, okay, one situation where there's not one author or where the author is not exclusively the, the older of Copyright, but this is still a situation concerning authors. Okay, it's not one; it's a lot of them. <laughs> so, what about people? We were talking about publicity. What about people who are working for other people, who are hired to work for other people in creative or intellectual processes? I mean, designers working for a, a company or hired to design an album cover for someone else, or um, people who make, uh, who are hired to do the, the um, sound identity of a brand. Do you think Nosh, for instance, the big, the big uh, telephone company here in Portugal, when they hired this big British publicity brand, uh, company to make their brand and sound identity that they don't own the copyright over the over the the these creations. They own it. They most definitely must own it. So when you're creating for someone else, when you're commissioned, it's it's called a commission. Uh, sometimes people are, are hired to do creative work and in, in, in instances like this it can be determined that the copyright of intellectual creations belongs to the boss, let's say. So in Portuguese law specifically, I'm going to come back to Portuguese law uh, a lot because it, it's the context that we're operating in, right? So in, in Portuguese law specifically, um, commission works um, must state that the intellectual property that's generated from that work uh, will belong to the commissioner, okay? To the commissioner of that, um, of that work. So, and the law is very precise regarding this and says that it must be written down. If it's not, there's a presumption operating in favor of the author. The, the, or, or 
code of, of copyright is very protective of the authors and offers a lot of presumptions in, case, in cases where it, it wasn't written down or it's not defined, it was not discussed, then in that case, the law presumes that the ownership belongs to the intellectual author. Um, I have also worked in a case where we were working with, uh, with a designer um, that eventually left a company where he, where he was where he, not not he was he was not hired in, he was not a, a laborer for the company he was hired to do this design work for the company and eventually they got off on the wrong foot and it, it all all went to hell and they kept using this identity he had created and changing it and using it in ways that he didn't, didn't want them to. And we eventually also um, won this case specifically with this presumption uh, operating. There, nothing was written down saying that by creating this design that the, the commissioner of the design owned it. And the law operated in favor of the author in this case. But it's not like this everywhere. I'm, I'm, I'm letting you know the specific Portuguese um, Portuguese context, but there are legal provisions probably in, in every legal system regarding commissioned works because uh, it's a it's a fairly uh, it's a fairly common um, situation in day-to-day -day commercial activities. So co-authors, uh, commissioners, what else? Sometimes even if you're working for someone who's hired you um, and nothing has been written down regarding your, your, your intellectual creation ownership, you don't own what you create. And this is the case of uh, ent special entities like newspapers and magazine issues, which are collective creations. So although they are created by many people, they are usually, copyright is usually attributed to a single entity. Usually the company who owns the newspaper. So this publication is made by the contributions of a lot of different people. But most of these contributions are not actually um, listed. You will, you will read news that don't have um, an, a journalist's name associated to it. It would say the editing room, for instance. Uh, or you would, have, you would have opinion pieces, and those opinion pieces are uh, signed by an author. So in cases like this, where you can identify and extract specific pieces of intellectual creation, like an opinion piece, well, in this case, intellectual property ownership is of the author. In all other cases, for instance, and most commonly, the design of the, of, the, of, the, um, of the newspaper, it belongs to, it's, a, it's part of this collective work and it belongs to the company that's promoting the creation of this work, which is a magazine, a newspaper, or, or other, other um, creations as such. Everything, <laughs> everything good? <laughs> okay, so who? What about how? <laughs> so how do you get copyright? And there's definitely a lot of guesses regarding this. So we've checked what can be protected, who gets protected, um, but how does this protection operate? Who, like, how do you get copyright? Does anyone have any clue? <laughs> so this, so there's any, do you think there's, it's like a yeah, formal it, thing? Or? Yeah, usually relying on, a, on other companies to do that, to do the, the legal stuff. Um, I don't know. Usually. So you think there's legal formalities involved with so. copyright? I think so. Okay. I think so. And anyone else wants to chip in? <laughs> so remember when I said that I wrote a poem and I put it in my drawer 
and I hadn't showed it to anyone and it's still co protected by copyright. Yeah. I didn't do anything. As soon as I expressed, as I externalized that poem, it became protected. So if right now I improvise a jingle for you right here. I can do it. <laughs> if I improvise and it's original, it's creative, it's, um, it's an expression of my intellectual self, well, it's protected immediately. You cannot go around reproducing this how you want. <laughs> Well, you have to, you have to, you have to prove it that it's you, have to prove, you have to prove it if you have to go to court for of it. Course. I mean, the, the, the idea is it comes from this very uh, Jews, natural, Jews nat naturalistic idea that as soon as this expression is made, it's worthy of protection. So what you're saying essentially is what happens then when two people have this exactly the same idea and express it in exactly the same way, uh, in the way that they're indivisible and they're essentially copies of one another? I mean, I, I think it's a very fair intellectual exercise, but as it's not really important in a practical matter because it will not happen <laughs> very, very often. I would say, uh, of course, whatever comes first, whatever comes first at, has been created first, and so the other, the other creation is a copy. And you get that, although it's protected right away, it's copyrighted right away, you do have public entities where you can register a work of art or a literary creation or a scientific creation. In Portugal, it's called IGAC, and it will serve as proof. So that registration will serve as proof of authorship. But it's not mandatory. One of the definitions of it, it's not mandatory. And it's, uh, it's set like this by the, specifically by the Convention of Bern as well. If, if you do that, if you have the, the opportunity to check your, or well, someone can check your poem and copy it, and mm -hmm. you didn't do anything, your poem was right there, and someone uh, just copy it and go to the, uh, Igak. Igak and mm -hmm. uh, make a, a registration and saying that it is his own. But you say, no, I wrote it five years before you put it there. Yeah. But you, you will have to prove it that you wrote it five years before. Well, of course, it's a pain in, in yes, basically. Oh, but oh, yes, oh, I will yeah. have to prove it. But in this case, it's the case you're presenting, it's materially possible. It's relatively easy. I can show my document, it can be dated in, in a way. So we're, we're in the grounds of speculation here, but imagining that such a situation happens. EGAC, uh, the registration gives a presumption of authenticity, right? But it's an, in, in legal terms, we call it an illegible, it's an illegible um, uh, presumption. So you can prove that that presumption is wrong, basically, by whatever means are possible testimony, someone saw me write that before you, material proof, here's the document, you can date it, you can see it. No, I was thinking like yeah. more easy to happen is like, okay, you, you, are, you are in a, a band and you play it and you create some, some song and you have a, like a demo tape or something uh, for like 20 years ago and you play it and someone from the band that doesn't have the owner of, of the, he was not an author, author or something, just a mm. few years later, he okay, he plays that song and he say that he's his own, and mm. you say no, that, that that's my song. I created, it, I, I wrote it, but it's, if you have a date or something in the demo tape that they can show it that it was your own and just before well, the, of course, it's all. Well, it's, well, it's a problem it's, because if the song starts to be... It's all a case-to-case situation. It's part of the, well, 
it's part of the proof. It's yeah. the proof part of a court case, obviously. And it's not always easily demonstrable. But still, I think this is a very... These are... <laughs> The case, the case you're pointing out, it's not so hypothetical. I mean, I can imagine stuff like yeah, that happening. It's easy. Entire careers probably yeah. <laughs> happening like that. But it's still, it's demonstrable that uh, you authored something and not the other person. Actually, we're going to talk about what does that represent in criminal terms, mm -hmm. actually. Okay. So, so yeah. Copyright attribution does not require any formality. So what I was saying, the mere externalization is sufficient, although this is not true for every country. And here comes the, 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 the part that might uh, give you a bit more security. For instance, in the UK, I'm not uh, entirely sure if it's still like this, but in the UK, you, you need not only to externalize um, a work, an intellectual work, you need to fixate it in a material object. Like, for instance, the example I was giving you, if I sunk an original lime rick right now, that wouldn't be sufficient. I would have to record it in a way and deposit it, okay? So, the general idea from Byrne is this, the mere externalization is enough. It is not always like this in every country, but through harmonization, it's mostly like this, specifically in the, the European, European Union, it's mostly like this. So we have discussed before um, the developments in copyright, how it became, it started out as with the statute of, of Anne as a 14 year renewable, 14 year um, exclusivity for authors, and how the French Revolution came to understand copyright as a sort of a property, and how it's very intertwined with economic exploitation and generation of revenue. So, what do you think today is the standard for copyright duration? So after the how, how long? For how long do you get it? <laughs> I think 70 years after your death. That's very good. That's absolutely correct. <laughs> So the Berne Convention states... Why? 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 I can, I can uh, well... Because you have to make money. <laughs> I can, we'll, we can get to that. So uh, the Berne Convention states a minimum of 50 years. And 50 years has been the standard for a long time. But as we've discussed before, these lobbying practices and uh, revenue from intellectual property has been pushing and pushing and pushing this, this limit. So most uh, countries have um, a 70 year after the death of the author, and we're talking about specifically about authors here, but we have seen that not only authors, as in singular persons, entities, can own copyright. So we can, uh, that's also a fair question. We have some lawyers in the room <laughs> that can answer that, <laughs> that can answer that later. But we can also discuss like, does a company die in that case? And uh, 70 years after a company dies? We can discuss that later. But uh, Byrne Convention stated 50 years. A lot of countries have been pushing it to 70 years. Mexico has 100 years. And I think it's the longest term. Uh, there, are, there were some propositions in the United States, uh, very wild propositions such as infinite minus one day, because <laughs> you cannot legally cannot define infinity, so you have to you have to set an amount of time. So infinite minus one day <laughs> has been proposed, and crazily enough, this has been treated in, a, in, in, the, in, the, um, in the legislative houses of uh, the US favorably, okay? There's, there's been this schedule. So whenever you think we're going too far with copyright protection, 
you just like hold my beer because <laughs> someone will try to take it a bit further. <laughs> So 70 years is a long time. 100 years is a ve after the death of an author is a long time. I think one of the longest copyrighted works is actually, uh, because, of, because of Mexico 100 years uh, law, is actually almost 200 years old. I think, uh, I don't know if it's a Mexican author or not, but, but it's almost 200 years old. So you can imagine 200 years ago, was this author really concerned on having his work protected and barred from public access and free use in the future like this? Mm -hmm. So again, this tension between public interest and the creation of, of cultural goods versus the protection of authors is is very much relevant i uh, just just let me just conclude this idea i i i call this uh, workshop copy makers this math class copy makers because i had a law teacher once that um did this analogy which i i thought was was very funny so there's someone looking into a forest so they're outside the forest and they're looking towards the forest. And they can see a giant's head above the very tall trees of the forest. And they're terrified of this giant. They're surprised that there's a, a, someone that can be taller than the trees. So although they're terrified, they're also curious. And they move into the forest, try to reach this giant and check for themselves closely what this giant is. And once they get there, they realize that it's not a giant at all. It's just people stacked on top of each other. And it's just the guy, the head he was seeing with just the head of one person that's stacked on top of hundreds of other persons, people. Uh, so this is a lovely metaphor, I think, for the creative process. And we're all essentially, in a way, copy makers, as in very rarely something is created out of vacuum. So copyright plays a very important role in protecting authors from exploitation and abuse, but also uh, plays a, a, a role in keeping, from, uh, keeping innovation from, from flowing and creativity. And, Although we're talking about copyright, which is more in the creative area, um, if we talk about other intellectual uh, property uh, ideas like uh, like patents, I read uh, somewhere the other day that we could be 10 years away from the cure to cancer if only scientific papers and, and patents were, were not in place, Pharma pharmaceutical patents were not in place. So there's a lot of barriers to knowledge sharing. Go ahead. Okay, so, but the question, if someone is concerned about protecting their work for like so many, so many years, I think Roberto Bollano, the, the writer, when he was uh, not in this deathbed, but he, he knew that he was severely ill and he would probably die um, in a short time, he wrote this big uh, masterpiece, I don't remember the, the number because it's a number, <laughs> one year, just to provide for his family. I think, okay, uh, some analogy with some Portuguese thinking or philosophy. When I plant a cork oak, I'm not thinking of providing to my, like, my son or my daughter, I'm thinking of providing for my grandchildren, probably grand-grandchildren. I think it is exactly the same case. If, if I think like my, prop, my, my work is, is an asset, of I want course. that asset to, that, to last. That <laughs> would be the argument. And that, that derives specifically from this idea of intellectual creation as property, as intellectual property. So this idea that it can be attained and exploited is what, it's, it's what has been ser serving as the basis of of the protection lasting so long, which it, it's funny how it, it has influenced 
very strongly copyright countries, copy, uh, this distinction between copyright and, and uh, droit d'auteur, um, copyright countries like the US. The US did basically a 180 on this issue. They were against such strong and long-lasting protections. They were concerned with the reproduction aspect of, of, of copyright. And suddenly, um, the US becomes a very big exporter of intellectual property. And now it's in their best interest to protect it longer in time. I have a, 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 a nice, a, a nice um, anecdote about the, the US in terms of intellectual property. So in the first innovations in intellectual property in the US were protectionists. So they would, for instance, protect Mark Twain, which was an American author, but they wouldn't protect British authors. So you could freely uh, reproduce works by authors from outside the US, but Mark Twain was protected <laughs> and did an entire career out of this. So these sort of protections are strategic and they are, um, they are political as well. Wait, wait, sorry, back there, oh, Diog. <laughs> It was already <laughs> with the end in I'm sorry. <laughs> Just to, to comment what Miguel was saying, uh, of course you can look to intellectual property as you look for oaks, but as other properties, they can be exp uh, exported by the state for another meanings. And also you need to understand that intellectual property as, uh, needs to balance the, the protection of the property of the author but also the access to culture and to knowledge by the community. Mm -hmm. That's why you have these kind of limitations. Otherwise, you only protect the property, but you will not protect the access that the community needs to have to your work and the, the free uh, derivative work. So that's why you would limit the time. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just to comment. No, I think it's such a fascinating question, like this generational thinking. And I think that the tree is a nice analogy because I've been thinking about this. Like I have a tree that I planted uh, and that's on my balcony, but like my balcony will become too small. But I actually, if I'm, for example, uh, my next apartment might not have a place for it or my ma next apartment might have like a small garden. I might plant it, but I'm not going to live in my next apartment forever. It would still be nice to plant a tree because, I mean, you plant not just for the children, but also for anybody else who might come and live there. But then the seven. Um, so it's interesting this 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 idea of thinking. But then the the more important question is like maybe will it, could it actually provide for my children something useful? The fact this is a property and the the cold and harsh reality is that the economic value of most works peaks about the time it's released. Like mm. uh, the first years. Like most most if you sell a painting in a gallery. That's a. That's the moment Excellent where it's point. worth the most money. And then there are a very few cases where it might be the case that it's not true. But because, of course, we all want to be that artist whose work will be <laughs> worth a lot in the future. <laughs> we like to project ourselves in that scenario. Yeah. But it's a very rare scenario. But what, um, but what, what publishers and media companies, they hedge their bets because they work with a lot of artists. And also they work with artists that already show some promise and commercial success. So they can have maybe 20 artists and most of their works will not be economically valuable yeah. uh, f uh, uh, for a long time, but some will and they, then they can, they, can, they can reap the benefits. So for in as an individual artist, it's, 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 a, it's not very likely that you will be economically, that, there will be an ec that yeah. economically what you make will be worth something in the future, but it might still be culturally uh, yeah. uh, worth something. And there is, that is where this qu question of balance comes in. Um, so in the future, you might come up on the work uh, uh, of somebody who was in your community or that you're interested by, you want to do something with it, or you've re researched them. And then it turns out that uh, their, their grandchildren or the people who own the company and that people that might not really, that actually might have even less of maybe a spiritual or artistic connection to the work than you, they get to decide and that can really get well, into the way of, uh, of, of the production or dissemination of culture. And this is exactly where this tension is going to arrive. And where for me, for example, this very long uh, copyright terms 
the lobbying for it is all pushed by big companies. Of course. But the reason that it's still uh, that it exists because we still live in democracy. So <coughs> if if if, the, if if people would be concerned by this, it could something could have happened. But the reason it's 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 it's, it's had never really has been opposed is because most artists like to think that they'll be part of the people whose work is economically viable in a hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> So one thing you've mentioned about these companies, uh, this is a, almost off topic, but I think it, th these ideas are very well connected. And I think we should all be very, very suspicious of this nostalgia industry that's setting in. And it's not the sweet, innocent thing that people want to revisit their memories from Star Wars from when they were a kid. It's a push to, it's, also, it's in part also lobbying to push the protection over these IPs, over these intellectual properties. And I have never been more bored with mainstream culture as today. Everything seems to be a remake or a, <laughs> or a, a recreation and it's in part due to these works still being protected and still being super profitable and exploitable for big companies. So I, I, will, I will let you talk. I, I, I'm going to conclude and we can talk a little bit because it's already <laughs> one, one twelve. But I'll give you this clue for our next, <laughs> for, for the afternoon. So think about these two ideas, economy and morality. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like um, uh, the name of a record by, by oh, what, they have the, the architecture and, and morality as well. What's the name of the band? I forgot. Well, it doesn't matter. Uh, but yes, please go ahead. Um, so I was thinking about uh, yeah, intellectual property, especially when it relates to the music industry. Uh, I know that in... Uh, uh, you, ha you have these uh, writing sessions mm -hmm. taking place and I think it's still the case that uh, when these happen, everyone who is in that room physically uh, co-own the intellectual property. <coughs> this is just what I heard. I'm not a lawyer. I'm also asking, I th but I think it's the case that if you're taking part of a, a writing session, even if it's not your idea, that was expressed, you are still in the room, therefore you're also owning, co-owning well, this. Well, our, our, uh, our um, talking legally specifically, the, the idea behind collaborative works and co-authors mm -hmm. is there has to be a meaningful contribution to, to, to the creation of that work. So if you're merely assisting, for instance, someone if you're merely, you're, you're part of this writing group, okay, you're in the room, but your only role is to check for spelling. Then you're not, you could not legally in Portugal be considered uh, a co-author. So there has to be a meaningful creative contribution to the, to the text. Well, it, but isn't it, uh, that's also part of my question, isn't it uh, kind of protected who is invited in that room in the first place because of the, um, I don't know how it works in Portugal. I think it's the case in the US and in Germany. I'm not 100% sure now, maybe. Well, okay. but yeah, no, I think that's a super, super interesting um, uh, mechanism and, it, and it's great. Uh, I think it's a great example of a way people find to deal actually with this question of like, how do you, how do you, uh, how do you determine who is the offer? Because I think the mechanism you're describing is not a legal mechanism, of but course. like an industry, an industry kind of um, uh, how do you Work say? Workaround. Uh, yeah, uh, it's 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 um, an understanding that within the industry, because of course the setting up writing in such a collaborative way it opens up the 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 you know it makes a lot of disagreements possible. So uh, the, the, so it's it's kind of like an understanding that people say, okay, we're gonna get. We're going to do a bo writing boot camp and we're going to write these songs and we don't want to uh, spend the next decades haggling over who wrote the hit and who so wrote the, piece, the, the song <coughs> that does not. So we, we, we determine that who's going to be in the room 
And then, of course, uh, there's super interesting anecdotes about this or people who are credited as co offers people that were just hanging out and it's 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 really not I think it's super interesting um, um, a super interesting philosophically even yeah. because you could be like okay we were in this room for a week and then I did not add any like chords to this song but I've been adding to the to the vibe and so I think it's a very nice mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's so for instance I think it's a great instance just to and, and but it's but something that's really mirrored, <laughs> mirrored in bands also. Like a lot of bands, of they course, some yeah. bands they have <coughs> a setup where they say, okay, we want to determine who wrote the songs, and uh, other bands they want to they want to say no, we're not going to spend our time hassling about this. We're going to credit all all the all the band members on all the songs because we are a band and we don't want to spend our time like developing the I'm properties. I'm so going to give you the <coughs> example of my band in specific, which is similar to your writing room sort of idea. So within our writing room, which is our rehearsal room, uh, I'm the only one who, who writes lyrics, for instance, and uh, Rafa it writes eighty percent of guitar riffs, for instance, and uh, Rui is a, the bassist, he hates playing bass, and we make all the bass lines for him. So he's, he's, he's with us because we've been friends for 15 years and we just can't be apart. He doesn't really like music that much or playing bass, but it's still, he still does, and we write all the, 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 um, the, the bass lines. Legally, what would happen was each of us would have this authorship very well defined, what we have decided is we are a single entity and we're a collaborative entity and we divide authorship exactly in the same share to everyone. And people contribute to this band in like who doesn't write a single line of bass, but we couldn't stand the idea of being in this band without him or going on the road is the one who takes care of all the things related to technical aspects or, you know, like we feel that sharing the revenues from our intellectual property doesn't that must reflect more closely the more philosophical aspects and practical aspects as well of being in a band and not specifically how we contributed creatively to it. But that is something we have decided. It's not a legal mechanism. Which I think is what you were. Uh, it's more moral. It's, an, it's more moral than. It's an ethical question, really. Yeah. Okay, so you trust each other, right? Well, we've been together for more than fifteen years. Uh, <laughs> I would hope so. <laughs> uh, okay. No, but we have n we've never set it down on paper or anything. We have just tacitly agreed that this is the way to go and okay trust yeah. faith trust good faith, faith yeah. you know so we need a little bit of that sometimes of course but but, you could, but, but i understand i understand what Diog, Diog is being playing the lawyer part here yeah, obviously yeah, yeah. <laughs> i understand but what yeah okay. well but in copyright sometimes you do i mean if okay. you if you if we actually i think for sharing I think the same rules for co-propriety apply here. So I think we would have to have it, if we had wanted to divide it differently, we would have to have it written down. Yeah. Equally, we don't need, it's, the agreement is... Sorry, I was not speaking. The agreement exists, exists, yes, of course. Can I make a practical question about your, your work? Yeah. How did you manage to... Um, this is or going way okay. off topic now. Actually, <laughs> did, did you contact Rosa Ramalho family to have her vocals and her interview in your album? Uh, she's, she's probably the, no, the, the big the star of the album, right? Copyright copyright doesn't belong to to Rosa. In that sense, it could never belong to Rosa because it's a statement made to an information um, information uh, company, a public information RTP, right? Uh, so the copyright that exists is of RTP over the the piece. Okay. And morally, how do you feel about that? Do you think you are? Uh, 
because it, it is okay people probably don't know what, what I'm talking about but the so in uh, we release a record and we use pieces of a statement made in an interview by um, a ceramist from the 1960s from from Marcelles which is, is uh, incredible and we love it we love her uh, well morally it's uh, I feel pretty okay with it actually I think it was uh, in a in a in a way, it created discourse around her work, which we thought was really important. Uh, and I don't mean to say this in the sense of like we were discussing. We gave her a platform. Actually, she <laughs> she's the one who's giving us a platform because she's a lot more important than than we are. But we uh, we used snippets of it that were. Uh, discoursing with our own work so there's a there's a discourse idea here it's not like we don't we wanted to it's sort of like when you want to say something but you need someone else's words and I thought that was really cool to, to find that interview but to answer your your your, your um, question very promptly did we license it with uh, RTP? No, we didn't. <laughs> I was going to ask you about that because I, <coughs> I did the same uh, in my work. I use one thing from RTP and some from BBC. Mm. And uh, we just went for it. We just like, okay. I mean, I'm absolutely... I'm absolutely uh, comfortable with with this in Portuguese, in Portuguese we have this expression in casa, in casa de Ferreira Espeto de Pau. It's hard to translate, but in in a blacksmith's home you would use a wooden a wooden stick <laughs> instead of a steel stick. So it, it reflects that in if you in the places where you are most informed is sometimes the places where you are the least careful. Uh, but like this is. If we, if we consult, we are going to talk about limitations and, and fair use a little bit. This is very debatable if it's uh, fair. It's a piece of a work that's been used to create another work, but it's not really. It's it's copyright infringement. It's what it is. <laughs> Let's just cut this from the broadcast. No. <laughs> it's copyright infringement. What it is? But I I think I think the the we used uh, we used a piece of of an interview from 1968 of a public broadcasting company that's actually very supportive of us. They have invited us for, uh, for tons of interviews because specifically of that. And none of them ever questioned like, oh, wow, but this is actually our, <laughs> our copyright. So it's funny in that sense. But, uh, but if they wanted to, they... Yeah, we, we, yeah. we actually discussed that. We, we, we said, well, if it was from a private uh, a TV, Oh, we, we, we would, would be totally screwed, totally screwed. But then again, mm. I turn the TV sometimes and I, I, I listen to a song by an artist that I know and I know that they haven't been, you know, this is, it, I, I don't want to call it payback, but it's like, I'm ethical if you're ethical. <laughs> 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 or sort of, this is non-hostile piracy, basically, yeah. in the name of art. And I guess we're going to get into this also, but I guess there's, there's almost no way to be completely correct with copyright, so mm. it also gets to being, to like calculated risk-taking, no, in a way. Of, uh, I was going to say exactly that. We were, when we were discussing before, uh, like court cases and, and using, are, am I going be, to be taken to court or not? Even if you, you assume that you are absolutely within the law, you can't expect someone else to think the same. So it always involves risk taking. I mean, I think DJ Shadow, uh, at, like, it was DJ Shadow? I think so. It's in your book, isn't it? Yeah, I think DJ Shadow, <laughs> So he, like this is shadow, and in the hip hop community, this is a big, big deal. I mean, hip hop is basically built on building the building blocks are other people's works. Also, but to quote, not only to quote this is shadow. I don't know if you know this artist called Girl Talk. It was big in the, the late 2000s. He did mashups basically, 
he mashed the Ramones with Britney Spears, basically. And they created this super intense, creative music. And he played Coachella, he did all these huge, huge things. There's no way he could have got clearance for all of that. Maybe for some, but it, there's no way to get clearance for... If you're working with samples and you're, you're working with mashup, there's no way you're going to get clearance for everyone. Because everyone's going to think that you're going to be the cash cow, that, uh, that, that everyone's super overly protective of, of, of works. That's, that's also why I feel this whole topic feels like a gray zone that only lawyers or people with a lot of money can uh, can win like I, I feel yeah. like it feels like such a un uh, unaccessible uh, topic and even when we're discussing here or even when i've been um, trying to really figure out how to do it in the most right way with the live streams for instance mm -hmm. even youtube won't reply me in a clear way so it's uh, it seems to be that okay we're all just risk taking in the name of art uh, but if someone wants to make a problem out of it, then you just have to go along with it. That's a bit of... That, that's the part I was mentioning about. Good faith and transparency are really, really important in all of this. And most of these situations will sort themselves out without a lot of hostility. For instance, the case with Rosa Ramal. I have never, I have always stated, and every opportunity I had, I had always stated, this was amazing because I got to find out about this in the, the archives of FTP, which are online, and it's an incredible tool for researching and for finding. And if they wanted to enforce their copyright, well, I wouldn't have be able to create this work that people have been actually doing great reviews and saying that it's incredible to be able to talk about Rosa Ramalho again, and etc. So it's a, it's a, yeah, it's risk testing, but also a, a fine balance. <laughs> Yes, yes. No, I... Sorry, just, just to share. Um, everything is like risk management, and uh, even in the law. Uh, mm -hmm. You know you cannot high speed from 50, but you go on the street and you drive a car uh, on 80 because and you risk, you are managing the risk of not being caught by the police. <laughs> and uh, most of the areas of law is like this kind of risk management. That's why you have different fields and different consequences of penalties for when you infringe the law. Concerning also copyright, uh, I believe that most of the cases are about risk management. Uh, yeah. Of course, you know that you, if you violate a copyright of Disney, maybe the consequences uh, will be used concerning other artists yeah. or other companies and you need to manage the risk. Also concerning the, the music of uh, Nuno, uh, you have copyright but also you have GDPR, also you have personality rights. <laughs> you have different fields of law yeah. concerning only one specific. Yeah. Why he didn't have problems? Because maybe he just used the voice of another artist and she understands, or their family understands, the importance of us to create derivative works and use the other's works to create another beautiful things. Yeah. But if you would use, choose to use the voice of someone that wants money, <laughs> maybe you'll, you would get an email, please pay me <laughs> because you are using my voice. Yeah. So it depends on the, the works and also the, the way you do your work. Um, mm -hmm. he, want, he wanted to create a creative work, so n not for the, the to make money, but to only for the the pleasure of creation, and maybe that's why he didn't have any problems, mm -hmm. even though he, he, he violated the law. <laughs> 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 Sorry to tell, I'm a felon. <laughs> we need, we really need to, <laughs> to stop. I think, or we can start later in the afternoon. I don't know. Just, just a quick note. Uh, yeah. What is, What is hard for me is that the answer is almost it depends. Well, I'm very sad to state that you're absolutely correct. <laughs> but, but it's really the attributes of the, of the, the law. I'm sorry. 
Yeah. Maybe for the lawyers, not for the others. No, 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 no. even for the authors and as a citizenship. Uh, yeah. The beautiful of the thing and also about criminal law is that it depends. <laughs> it depends if you are caught. It depends on the interpretation of the law. It depends on the case law. Otherwise, you would living in a police state that everything course, is strict. Sure. So that it's, hard, right? yeah, it's hard because you need always to push for the boundaries. Yeah, exactly. But that's the way you're living. Otherwise, it would be very difficult <laughs> to live in this kind of police society that everything is very strict. And uh, if you are... Imagine that if you are driving a car above the speed limit and all the other cars can give, uh, pre uh, take a photograph of you and send it to the cops and then you get the fine. That's mm -hmm. forbidden mm -hmm. because yeah. you will only be caught if you are caught by authority, <laughs> not mm -hmm. by a citizenship. Mm -hmm. that, uh, and for me, that's very important. Otherwise, we could not um, cross the boundaries of the law and live in this kind of something so risk you management. Can, you, can right? you can in Portugal you can report. Oh, uh, we're gonna get there. Yeah, uh, I'm not going to be a spoiler. You, you will, <laughs> you will talk about you that. Expect, <laughs>
um, the scope of these rights and the limitations and exceptions to it differ um, depending on the type of work and also from country to country. But again, they are fairly harmonized. So this is to say economic <coughs> rights are um, an author's, an author's, um, an author's way to, um, or a power, let's say, to authorize and or prohibit a use and set the conditions for the use of a work. So if someone, for instance, would like to use a song that I have authored in a commercial and I am the only one, I'm the only author and I'm the only one who can authorize this use, I can set the conditions for this use. This is making use of my economic rights, in Portuguese, direitos uh, patrimoniais, over, um, over the, 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 the work. Uh, and these conditions can be set in a variety of ways. I can set how much I want to be paid for a single use or for um, a, a plenty of uses, a portion of it, a portion of the, the work or the entirety of the work. Uh, I can set what kind of uses can be made for it or the territory where this use uh, can, can be made. So this is all in the power of the copyright holder to determine how, when, in what form a work can be used. So, examples of this that have been uh, codified in our law uh, and that are roughly similar to, to other legal systems. For instance, to make reprodux reproductions of copies of the work in various forms, to distribute the work to the public, to make translations or adaptations of the work, to communicate the work to the public, to rent or lend copies, to perform, show or play the work in public. So this is all part of the economic side, economic side of copyright. This is all part of this um, power that's conceded to copyright holders, whether as we've seen they're the authors or not. Because sometimes you can <laughs> not be the, the <coughs> copyright holder. You can alienate uh, your economic rights. This is a very important aspect and a very important differentiating aspect from, from moral rights in 99% of the, of, of the legal systems. So it's basically shift in sense. The tradable nature of economic rights means that sometimes the copyright holder is not the author of intellectual creator. Um, they are alienable rights. So, for instance, you could come across situations as, I believe it was Paul McCartney who alienated his, um, part of his catalogue, I think, to Michael Jackson of all people. I'm not sure, but I think it was Michael Jackson, yeah. So, and essentially what he did was not, he didn't transfer his authorship to another person. What it is was he sold to another person the rights to economically explore and exploit his, his works. This is the economic side of copyright. So whenever Paul McCartney, after doing that, went to play um, his songs on, on a big festival or a concert or whatever, he would actually have to pay copyright <laughs> to the owner of the copyright, which was then Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson. <laughs> which is a pretty good deal, I think. And you see, you see this time and time again. People are sometimes, artists are sitting on very big catalogs, very profitable catalogs, um, but sometimes they don't have they, they don't have the means to manage their catalog or they, they're not interested in collecting revenue, actively pursuing, pursuing this. As we've discussed before, um, not a lot of these works actually have that much revenue later in, in life. So sometimes you, can, you want to alienate, you want to sell your, your, your economic right to, 
to a work. You're all following this. Is, this is, I know it's a bit abstract sometimes to try to differentiate between these two ideas, but this is the very core, I would say, of intellectual property industry or the music industry besides uh, besides um, concerts and this is this is a, where a lot of the revenue comes from exploring intellectual property, property catalogs so the economic um, rights uh, are very 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 important so you could say that from a from a pragmatic practical point of view this is all you need to know okay so these are the rights uh, that control basically how uh, a work is used and this is all that matters but as, as we've seen there's this tendency maybe romantic tendency to associate different sort of rights um, to 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 copyright and this other side of it, the other side of the coin, is the moral, the moral rights. So the moral rights, instead of concerning themselves with income, um, basically protect the author's honor and the integrity of the work. And they vary from country to country again, but most countries recognize at least these two basic ideas about, um, about moral rights. So the author has the right to be named as the author of the work. So when the work of an author is reproduced, published, communicated to the public or exhibited in public, the person responsible for doing so must make sure that the author's name appears uh, on or in relation to the, to the work. Now you can imagine this, for instance, um, or maybe a practical, a practical way to, to explain this might be actually in the visual arts. Um, so visual artists sell their works. Imagine a painter will, would, be selling, uh, would be selling his paintings or a sculpture would be selling uh, their sculptures. What they're alienating is not, uh, is not their copyright over, over, the, over that work, but the object itself, which is there's a distinction between these, these two concepts. Um, so whenever this work is exhibited, the author can assert his moral right that is identified as the author of this work. And in a lot of ways, this is a way to affirm a certain continuity of uh, authorship and uh, I, I believe that there's 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 this idea especially in, in German uh, in German uh, philosophy and and, and uh, juridical writing that you can never entirely own a work you always have part of the author is always there part the ownership of the author is always there. So it's a more philosophical and ethical side of copyright. So another big idea is that the author has the right to protect the integrity of the work. So it prohibits the making of any changes, modifications, alterations to a work that would tend to damage the author's honor or reputation. Um, there's an example here of a colorization of a, a black and white picture. Uh, but other circumstances can arise. Uh, for instance, what do you think would happen? I think it was even prominently displayed in a TV show not long ago. Uh, the Winston Churchill um, had this um, had this um, portrait made by a painter, by a very famous modernist um, British painter, uh, towards the end of his life, which he did not enjoy. He hated the painter. The, the portrait was offered to him in a, in a big, uh, big celebration, and he hated the, the portrait. Um, and legend goes, I'm not, I'm not. No one's entirely sure. I believe if this really happened or, or not. But legend, legend goes that his wife actually burned the painting and destroyed the painting. 
So there's this the, the, there's this uh, idea behind the, the, the destruction, the defacement, the alteration of, of a work uh, that the author can assert uh, its integrity and that it must not, um, the, the, the fact that he's alienated his work doesn't mean that someone else can do whatever with it. Okay? And this is an important, important aspect of, of, of moral rights that's been codified in, in our legal system in a very, very um, um, strict sense, as we'll see uh, when talking about the violation of, of copyright. So, the main difference also is at, that unlike economic rights, the moral rights cannot be transferred to someone else because they are the personal creator. Even if the author sells the economic rights to someone else, the author retains the moral rights. But I was talking to Diogo uh, before, Diogo, and you mentioned that in the UK is not exactly like this. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I was saying that I'm not an expert on copyright law. <laughs> I'm from the continental law. But as far as I know, in copyright system, you can transfer the, the moral rights okay. and you can renunciate to the moral rights. So that's the one of the difference between author's rights and copyright law. Okay. I didn't. I, I I knew that the UK had re just recently. It's a recent innovation. Had finally, um, had considered moral rights in, in their. They recognize the moral rights because yeah. also the Berne Convention. But yes. They don't recognize the moral rights as the same as we do. Mm -hmm because of the history that you have spoken during the morning. But also the, the, the thing, and maybe we can discuss this, the, the thing with the Berne Convention, for instance, the US has basically no recognition of, of moral rights, and they're also signatory of the Berne Convention since 89. So how, I, I, I'm not sure how is this, how is this know, okay? I don't know if they made any opting out, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Concerning the US, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry? They're waiting, they're waiting for the tanks to roll in. To roll in, yeah. <laughs> to impose the, <laughs> the moral rights of authors. <laughs> so yeah, these two ideas are, are very important. Economic rights on one hand and the, um, the um, moral rights on the other. I'm going to take things a bit up to speed to speed now also because I want Diogo to talk about um, uh, Creative Commons still today um, before the end. Um, so we're going to um, we're going to assess later <laughs> tonight if all these concepts have been <laughs> assimilated I think but hoping I'm hoping that this has been has been helpful. Um, so a lot of a lot of concepts a lot of perspectives, but maybe maybe this is not enough. Maybe we need <laughs> something more. So we haven't talked yet about related rights, which is also a big component of uh, intellectual intellectual property. Can anyone tell me what are uh, related? We, we've touched up upon it before, but can anyone tell me what the related rights, maybe Dredge Connects, have you ever heard it before and you know what it is? <laughs> yeah, related rights is, is the rights of the performers of, um, for example, on the record, uh, the people that play on the songs but are not the authors, the, the writers. That's, that's perfect. That's one definition of, or one of the definitions of, of related rights. Uh, any, anyone, we've, we've talked about some other, other stuff that's connected to related rights. Can someone remember? Yeah, about the master. About the master, about the, the phonographic yeah. production, right? Um, so, related rights 
are basically living this sort of symbiosis with copyright. They are created in the context of the performance of a pre-existing work. They are awarded to a few categories of people um, that communicate or disseminate or perform some types, some types of works to the public. So an easy way to understand this is Tony Carrera. We all know about Tony Carrera, right? <laughs> Tony Carrera is, is our biggest pop singer. <laughs> well, pop. Have you, heard of, have you ever heard the, the, um, the term Pimba? Pimba, yeah. Pimba. Yeah. Lucky you. Lucky you. <laughs> Pimba is a specific form of popular music from, from Portugal that arose in the late 1980s, 1990s. And Tony Carrera is one of the icons of Pimba, specifically in the sort of romantic Latino singer kind of, kind of thing. So a lot of songs that Tony sings and records are not, ac not actually written by Tony Carrera. They're actually written by other people. Um, very prominently one, one man that can't actually sing, which is incredible, I think. <laughs> um, so the author of these works is this man. This man has written uh, these songs. He has externalized <laughs> this creative intellectual work. Um, and then he asked his good friend Tony, because he's such a bad singer, he asked his good friend Tony to record it in a professional studio. So Tony is essentially performing someone else's work, all right? But this performance is essential to the public distribution broadcast of this work. You, could, you cannot say that the work exists without the performance, it's the other way around. The performance would not exist without the work. So these are neighboring or, or related rights to, to copyright. Okay. Quick, just quick question. Um, is it also related rights when someone performs um, a folk, old folk song, let's say, that's a but no one really knows who the author is. That's, very, that's a very good question. So imagine this. Most classical music is in the public domain, one would argue. Yes, most of these composers from the 1700s have been dead, hopefully, for more than, <laughs> more than 70 years. So you could say that Bach's fifth or Schubert's or whatever, they're all, these works, these compositions are in the public domain. But unless you can play them yourself, <laughs> you are bound to have to listen to someone perform this, these works, okay? And you can't go around going to FNAC or any other store and picking up a CD from um, Mozart Symphony and saying, oh, this is in the public domain, so I can take this CD home with me. No, of course. So these performances are protected. So what you're saying is, this folk song that's in the public domain, yeah, the folk song is in the public domain. Anyone can record that folk song. But that recording has generated this new right, this related right for the performer Okay, for the performer of this, of this recording. And also, let's introduce here other players. Also, this recording is being made because a phonographic company a label is paying the studio and then reproducing this record as a vinyl, for instance. This generates another difference different right, which is the right to the phonograph, well, to the master, you would say. Okay? <laughs> so these are two different players here. One performing a work of art, and another fixating, distributing that performance. So three rights are generated here. 
differently through the same through the same intellectual creation. Wait, just to clarify, so I understand. So, mm -hmm. uh, what you said before about the related rights was when someone that is still alive have created something, but someone else is performing it. Mm -hmm. This is related rights, but uh, I'm not 100% sure. If I understood, is it still related rights when someone performs a work that belongs to the public domain? Yes, so absolutely. Okay. absolutely. Okay. So authorship doesn't change. I mean, mm. you have performed someone, you have performed a work that has fallen into public... I, I hate the word fallen into public domain. Ascended. I think it's ascended, I, I think, would be the more correct. I, thank you. <laughs> but... <laughs> So something that is now in the public domain, the authorship didn't, didn't disappear. What disappeared was the exclusivity to uphold these economic rights. Because also, I forgot to mention, moral rights are perpetual. <laughs> you, cannot, you cannot say that Beethoven's fifth is yours suddenly. No, you cannot delete authorship. It lasts forever. So this is a moral, moral right. Um, so who is related? <laughs> Performers, actors, musicians, singers, dancers, etc. Everyone who performs, who, who, who makes a work of art or, or an intellectual creation come to life, basically. So the dancers of a ballet, the actors in a play, they are all performers. And if their performances are recorded, like my performance uh, today is being recorded by, by these cameras, if their performance is uh, recorded, then they are entitled to authorize whether this performance can be reproduced or shown exactly like an author only an author can authorize that he, his or hers uh, work is reproduced and shown and broadcasted. Okay? What else? Producers of phonograms. We've talked about the, 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 basically the, the labels, the, the record labels. Not always a record label, but you get the gist. For their recordings, for the fact that they have recorded these performances. They have control over whether their vinyl or their CD, the CD that they have created, they have paid for, uh, they have invested in this. <clears throat> they are the ones who can determine how they are distributed <coughs> and how they are used, how they are sold, how they are rented, over the physical aspect of this, of this work. But now we, have, uh, different, uh, now we have a different reality because we have the digital. And it, it works almost the same. It's, it's still, I yeah. mean, it's easier, yeah. obviously, to understand this from the point of view of, uh, of uh, yeah. fixing it in a, in a physical, yeah. in a, but it, it doesn't need to be that way. It can be a digital. I can still be a record label and pay for, pay for uh, an uh, author to write a song and then a performer to perform it, and I record it and then I distribute it digitally. Digital, yeah. okay? And then there's another player here, which is not very important for what we're discussing today in terms of music industry, but broadcasting organizations also have, um, also have uh, related rights for their radio, television programs and, and podcasts, their shows, basically. So if I, uh, if I'm, if I create a radio show where I play uh, Portuguese music at 3 a.m. in Antena 3, I, <laughs> I don't own the, the copyright of the works I am, I am displaying, I'm broadcasting in my show, but I own the related right to, to this broadcast, okay? I can also own copyright over, uh, well, this is very meta now, but I can also <laughs> own copyright over what I say in, the <laughs> in, this, in this program. That's a, different, that's a different thing. So he, here you are. Performers, most copyright or re related right laws require you to obtain the consent of the performer prior to recording, broadcasting a live performance, as well as prior to reproducing records of their performance. 
Producers of phonograms, they can take action against unauthorized copying, use or distribution of the recordings and they essentially have control over the reproduction of their uh, phonograms and the right to receive equitable remuneration when uh, their phonograms are broadcasted or communicated to public. So when a record plays on the radio, for instance, there's revenue being generated in different ways here. There's revenue being generated for the author of the work that as long as he has authorized and negotiated a, a fee for this for this reproduction obviously there's the performer if they're not the same person and there's also the the producer of phonogram because the, the specifically his master is being played and then broadcasters enjoy the right to control the rebroadcasting recording and reproduction of their broadcasts and these rights that live on the edge of, of copyright, on the dependency of the existence of copyright, do you think they're analogous in any other ways to copyright? For instance, one very important thing is for how long do they last? <laughs> you can get like Shoot in the dark. <laughs> As we've seen, the tendency is not to be very gentle on this, <laughs> on the amount of time these things last. But. So, most countries, this is not, this is fair, fairly the standard, but it's not the, the requirement, but most countries, uh, protect related rights for 50 years, but 50 years counting from when? Because these are very different, uh, very different rights from copyright. Well, in the case of performances, when the performance took place. Okay, so if I went to the studio in today and I recorded uh, the, uh, a song, I performed a, a song, even if it's not distributed now or made public, uh, my right to the to to this my, my related rights to this performance will last for 50 years from today. In the case of of um, phonogram producers, 50 years from when the fixation was made, so when when the, the record per se was was created, and from the the perspective of, of broadcasting agencies, from when the broadcast took place. We're all on the same page still. <laughs> I feel like I'm throwing at you. You're, you're a lot more quiet in the afternoon. <laughs> I think you had a good lunch. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't have had wine. But <laughs> so please do feel free to interrupt me and ask questions if you if you need to, because we are going. This is. As I'm, I've, I've mentioned before, I, it's more, the idea is more to provoke conversation and explain doubts that you might have than to leave here as a legal scholar on, on copyright. That's, that's not going to happen. So the, we, the best use we can make of this is to generate uh, discussion. Sorry. Yeah. Is there a way of go around these 50 years? Like the the label can make like a remaster of the album and they will have fifty years more. I that's honestly, why they always making that is like a very interesting question. Yeah, I don't because it's a new release. I don't think so, yeah, but I remaster video. So a remaster is not fixating again the same the same I'm, performance. I'm, it's yeah, I'm not sure. I think that's semantics, but sure. I, I have to I have to assume here that uh, you you got me unprepared oh, in sorry. this. <laughs> no, yeah. it's it. This happens all no, the time. It's, it's tell me, it's tell me of a lawyer that has a client come in and will know, uh, like, of course, and will know exactly everything the client is like. A lot of times you have to. Wow, I've never been asked that before. I have to I have to investigate that. Uh, do, you, do you know this or? I, I was trying to make a fair. Sorry, I forgot the microphone. 
I was trying to think more in the um, parallelism with the cinema. If you make an, a new edition of the movie, uh, remastering the colors and adding three more seconds, yeah. maybe you can have... Yeah. But, that's uh, more of, but that's more of an adaptation. For me, that's more of an, of adaptation. an adaptation. Because remastering in music is usually such a technical device. It's usually... M remastering in music, I'll tell you what it is. Make it sound louder. <laughs> it's it's all there is to it. So it's for me really. I think it's more of a semantics question than than really. But, uh, but I, was I, but I I'm not entirely. I I cannot tell you that I'm entirely sure of what I'm saying. Yes, yes, and I'm only trying to make yeah, this yeah. kind of yeah. brainstorming now. Um, maybe one of the solutions to the answer is that the first work enters or accents to the public domain mm -hmm. and the remastering is still protected so but the remastering no that that's not for sure because no. it's a different work okay. if yeah. you if you want to defend that the remastering yeah. is able to be protected then because the it's a new yeah. a new work so the other goes the other to the public domain they're going to bring a drum kit in a second, and we're all going to start <laughs> jamming. <laughs> Copyrighted. No, but that's actually a really interesting point because, um, so, 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 it, it, like, like, like you're saying, it, the or, the original will not get new protection, of course. but a new adaptation might. So then, of course, what companies try to do is that they make the original less accessible yes. and less, uh, um, and but but also in many cr it, like it's. Uh, if you're doing some kind of adaptation with a work that uh, is in the public domain, uh, it's it, it's it's sometimes it's to to be the most sure that you're what you're doing is okay. Like, like it's for example, on Project Gutenberg, where they they publish uh, old books that are in the public domain, they always make an effort to find a book that was actually to actually find the first edition, so that they won't have this problem of a publisher saying, "But hey, we added a preface," of "Hey, we did some editing, we changed it." They go back to uh, a copy that was actually published, uh, but of course it can be hard to find that copy. And more on a creative level, like a translation, for example, is always an adaptation. So for yeah. example, you might say, I'm going to make a movie based on a book that's uh, in the public domain, but you use the Portuguese translation, and maybe that translation is actually uh, still uh, copyrighted. Protected. So you might want to make your own translation or ask permission for the translation. So it's it's often this kind of layer layer yes, cake, like a, like a onion <laughs> of of copyright. <laughs> that was an interesting question. Thank you, and I, I love the thought process <laughs> behind this. Um, so. Yeah, this is this is the, the the basic gist of related rights. And as your question is is posed, this this is a very broad um, area with a lot of a lot of still to be resolved uh, questions. Um, so I would like to start now with something that's not controversial at all, called collective management. <laughs> which uh, I, think you're, I think you're going to enjoy this. Uh, if you like SPA especially, you're going to, to enjoy this next part. So can anybody tell me what, what do you understand by, by this idea of uh, collective management? Or what these entities are, SPA, GDA, what do they do? Or in, in Germany, I think Gemma and cooperatives. Yeah, they are they are cooperatives. That's like their legal figure. But you are forgetting one in Portugal. Audio Audio yeah. Represent. It's important because they are yeah. representing the masters. That's very very well. Um, so let's try to imagine the following. We were talking before about how these technological innovations. Uh, permitted the reproduction of works, really the copying essentially of works really, really fast, right? And this has, this has created opportunities and also problems. Um, and the same 
can be said about broadcasting or the utilization of works in modern with modern technology and global broadcasting capacities uh, specific types of works more than others have become very hard to track essentially other use so this would be especially true for music for instance so if we know that for a song to be used an author has to give prior consent as to debate uh, his revenue set the conditions for the use of his work uh, you can imagine I think I've, I've made this point before that the Beatles were not at home hanging by the phone authorizing every other use of their song playing on the radio now in Japan now in Australia <laughs> so how do you manage this how do you manage in the contemporary super light speed world of the use of intellectual works how do you manage your role as an author who has all these powers for authorization and and revenue negotiating and so forth in portugal you have to sign to spa <laughs> <laughs> you have to. Yeah. It's a very, very important well, you can, you, expression. You can, sign, you, can, you can sign in another country if you want. No, no, but I, lo I love that you use in Portugal. Because you we don't have, have to. An, another choice. It's because you, and that's a, that is a fair, uh, fair um, analysis, mm -hmm. not only for the Portuguese scene, but worldwide, I think. So the author or the copyright holder may entrust the management of economic rights to an agent. Right? So I can, I can do whatever I want with my economic rights, so I can also let someone manage them for me. Okay? So what if this agent manages the rights of several authors? So essentially, he's building a repertoire. In many sectors, the copyright holder is forced to resort to a collective management entity. This is especially true in the music, uh, under quotes, industry. I hate this word, but you, you know what I mean. So, because authors do not have the physical ability to negotiate authorizations and remunerations, collective management ceases to be an option and becomes basically mandatory. So, uh, that's why I thought it was interesting that you said, you have to work with SPA, because you kind of do. So imagine the following scenario. You're a musician and uh, you, you put your songs out there on your band camp or whatever, and then Antena 3, the biggest alternative radio in Portugal, decides to play uh, your song. And then you call Antena 3 and you're very angry, as you should, because they haven't asked for your permission to, to play your song. And you call them and you tell them, well, you haven't discussed it with me. I had I not authorized you playing this song and I, uh, should, I should be reimbursed for, for this use. And they will probably be dumbfounded and answer something like, oh, but we already paid SPA. <laughs> Even if you didn't sign with SPA? Signed, I don't know. Yes. The thing is, yes. yes. Oh, okay. No, but the if thing I, is, a, uh, the thing I, is, the author is absolutely right in this case. Yeah. The other thing is, Antena 3, in a way, has no other chance. It's impossible to manage a big broadcasting station and having to check every, yeah. negotiate every time you want to to work, uh, to, to play, a, uh, to use a, a work. So collective management in itself is a useful tool. Basically, what happens is authors come together, they provide their repertoire to an entity that represents them, that negotiates with these players uh, that broadcast or use uh, their works, and they get revenue from it. And, you know, we're stronger together. If, we're, if we represent 
80% or 90% of the music made in Portugal, we can negotiate better fees, okay? Yeah. Than if we're trying to unilaterally negotiate. So the idea is, well, it's good. This is a practical system for the author and facilitates the use of works uh, for entities that enter into joint agreements. So why is it also bad on the s at the same time? <laughs> Can somebody think of... Because it all sounds very idyllic, right? Uh, if SPA pays me? I was not registered with SPA for a very long time, and then and then I became, uh, and it was sort of a. If if you're if this is my personal experience, if you're not uh, strong enough to beat them, you have to join them, essentially, because I was was never going to be able to convince radio stations to pay me. I, w I wouldn't yeah. even know how to negotiate with them. I wouldn't know how to open that channel. So I could never, in, in practical terms, it's so hard. It's easy to negotiate uh, someone wanting to use their music for a commercial, for instance. It's so one type use, you can discuss it, you can negotiate it. But there are other uses. How do, I, how do you negotiate with, your, with Spotify or with, you know, this hundreds and thousands of plays that these works have. So going through these entities is and maybe trying to change them on the inside because some of them work really, really well. I have no complaint. I have no complaints from GDA, for instance, which we're going to see what, what GDA does. But yeah, sorry. Yeah, we also discussed. Sorry, but they pay? <laughs> That's another question. Yeah, they've, they've paid. Oh, oh, oh. Well, well, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. But are you sure that they are, but are, you sure that they, they are paying everything that you really... You can never be sure. Yeah, if, if you have a publisher working with you and doing a right job, probably you will have. Mm, it's really hard. And I'm going to... It's technologically hard. Okay. And we're, go, we're it's moving... It's not technology. We're more, it is, actually. We're moving towards... Yeah, we're moving towards a more... So it's a, it's a double-edged sword, really. I have a friend who actually works with, with intellectual property technologies, control technologies. Yeah. And it, as, because these uh, users are getting so much more digitized now, the data is easier to access, right? But imagine, for instance, local radios. You have no way to know how many times they've played. Local radios fill in by hand. Mm -hmm. but, um, but do they charge you to be part of the, the comp? Well, that really depends on the entity. In the case of SPA, they charge a one-time 150 euro fee. Okay. Okay, I just jumped in in front because I really have a lot to ask <laughs> to say about this subject. Uh, well, just to start, so I've never registered anything to SPA, and uh, I really see them as the strong uh, men with the axe uh, in, uh, in front of the bridge uh, that uh, taxes everyone that crosses and then <laughs> gives half of that to the king. <laughs> um, <laughs> because he was caught by the king doing that and he, he negotiated, because it's a private entity for a start, yeah. uh, which bothers me a lot. And also, um, for what I've heard, because I really don't understand so much this uh, thing, and that's uh, one of the reasons we're here, mm. and I think a lot of people don't, is I don't think that the profits, the, the revenue is, uh, is uh, distributed on a fair. Uh, okay. th there is a fair system for that. Um, and also because uh, of what you're saying, like that is really difficult to really uh, know exactly who's playing what, mostly the big artists get a lot of revenue and a lot of small artists don't uh, get any, I yeah. believe, no? And are, are there any options, like can a Portuguese artist or label sign to uh, international, to another international uh, Definitely, entity? I know a lot of people who have done that. Okay. I'm going, to, I'm going to finish this section. It's 
two or three more slides that I think I'm going to provide are going to provide some more juice for this okay, okay. for this conversation because I knew this is going to happen. <laughs> so I'm going to to do that because we're at we're still at the good. <laughs> we're still at the good part. We haven't reached the bad yet. <laughs> so it's fun. It's easy. Someone represents me. Wow, thank God. Now I don't need to knock on the door of every radio station having to ask them for my money, right? So the bad, the authorizations are generic. They do not meet this requirement of prior authorization. And the works are basically negotiated in bulk. And why is this bad? Because it's essentially wholesale. Okay, since the works are traded in bulk, re redistribution of revenues depends exclusive, exclusively on an allotment criteria. So for instance, in terms of radio, someone was asking how, how do you determine this distri distribution? So in radio, the work that gets the most airplay gets a bigger slice of the cake. And this seems fair. I mean, if you make a song that's very popular, it plays, you did your job, let's say, better than someone who made a song that's not very popular and you, your song plays more, you get more money, that song plays less, you get less money. But essentially what this is driving many times is funneling creativity to this sort of whatever kind of works situation. And this is very prejudicial to artists who are working on more dangerous, experimental sort of fields. So they're all being measured by the same criteria and they're all being paid by the same standards. And I think divisions, for instance, categories would be very helpful. Imagine the following situation. So I play 100,000 times on the radio and I get a fair, my fair share of that, of that cake. Okay, that's fine. But maybe this artist who works in ex an experimental field and is going to get played on very specific author radio shows could happily receive five euros from that airplay instead of one cent, it would make a big difference. Maybe you could get that from a smaller cake. <laughs> you could have different, I'm, like, I'm not proposing a model, I'm just saying that artists working in different, different depths, basically, or different fields, different um, risk-taking opportunities should be able to negotiate differently how their works are used. And in the case, in the case of, of, of uh, these artists, they're basically condemned to, um, to resort to other means of, of revenue, which I think is absolutely legitimate. You could almost argue that the entire reason why a lot of touring artists still exist is because artists have to tour, some artists, some kind of artists have to tour to make money because they don't make money from intellectual property, which is fine. I get to see a lot of great artists touring because of that. But there is a problem here with, I think, with um, this airplay tyranny being the, 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 the standard for how this revenue is distributed. Another completely different problem is how do I know that this is being fairly distributed? But that is a, a problem specific to our Portuguese experience with SPA. I'm sure hundreds of people from other countries would probably have similar problems with their, with their um, collective management agencies, but it, Essentially, uh, I think I've met actually a lot of people who are happy with their with the with the management they have. So just just to to clarify one thing, you mentioned that they shouldn't be private uh, entities. I am not so sure about that. I'm a bit on the fence there because. It literally is an entity that's meant to negotiate. So this is 
this is an entity that you, you basically attribute the right to represent you. So it, it, for me, it rubs me kind of funny if you attribute that to a public entity. I don't know if I'm making myself clear, but yeah. like from a, if we're thinking about in commercial marketplace sort of idea, it doesn't, it makes sense that it, it is a private, although they are usually non-profit, uh, cooperative is, non, is a non-profit. Uh, so they, they don't work per se like a company would, and they're of public interest. Again, I'm not defending SPA, I'm saying that it's a, a complex and tricky idea. For instance, the, would, ha, would the state charge itself, for instance? But for using, if the state represented artists, would it charge itself? I think it's illegal actually to, to do that. <laughs> so. Of course they would, they would charge themselves, the government. I mean, within governments, I think this is a very common thing to do. Like, I don't know, I know in Belgium, for example, if you query as a government service, you query the national registry of like, um, which has the names and addresses of people, mm -hmm. you pay them. And that's just a thing the government set up to make it work more or less efficiently because if there would be no payment, it, it gives the incentive no, for no, people to that's be... No, no, but that's different. That's the users paying to access that... No, no, yeah, but the users is the government then in most of the cases because it's only the government who can query this database. Okay. But all parts of the government, they pay that part of the government to do it. Okay. And it incentivizes that's them to not query the database all that's, the time. That's that's interesting. I I work with uh, I work in a in a municipality and there's a lot of for instance uh, the touristic tax something that that's very that, that's in the news. Uh, if I if I invite someone from outside, if I had invited Eric to a talk on uh, promoted by the municipality and he stayed in a hotel, I it would not be legal for me to pay the touristic tax because I would essentially be paying it to myself. The municipality would be paying the touristic tax to, it, to itself. So there's public, public um, finances uh, issues here. But even, even if that's not the case, I believe uh, public agencies to promote, uh, to promote um, a better... Um, a more healthy copyright environment and protection for authors is more than welcome, more than welcome. So I'm, I'm on the fence and I think it's a complex issue here. So yeah, I think the question here is more about um, a for-profit organization or not, mm -hmm. but also, well, this is like the uh, oldest argument between also socialism and capitalism. Uh, like, <laughs> if, like, does, do they make a better job because they're also charging and making a profit from it? Or, uh, you know, or... Um, or wow, that is, you know, that like, is uh, uh, that's just, going that's like just, uh, the <laughs> other way. <laughs> wow, dude, you can go, let's go public and then let's go totally private. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah but I understand. Um, I think the issue is, is with SPI as an issue of trust. I think a lot of people have had nightmarish experiences and have had um, um, the, the feeling that they're not being properly treated or that, or that bigger artists are getting preferable treatment, which Again, in a system that promotes whoever plays the most, makes the most, it makes sense that these entities would treat better the artists that are making them the, the, the revenue, right? So, for instance, GDA is a completely, just to finish also, GDA represents performers, okay? Represents the related rights of artists, um, such as actors, musicians, dancers. So they collect, uh, the same way that ASP SPA collects revenue from the uses of works for copyright holders, uh, GDA 
collects the the revenue generated from the uses of, of works uh, for the for the artists performing artists that have related rights connected to that to that work and Audiogest, as we've mentioned does the same for the other the other entity the the phonographic producers <laughs> I like this picture um, <laughs> So, because that's the amount of that's the amount of licenses that SPI usually has on the table that I can't <laughs> that I can't push them through. Uh, GDI, on the other hand, I have the most um, solicit. Um, bye bye. <laughs> I have the most solicit um, generous experience with them. Um, ciao. Even to the point of every year I receive a correction of revenue from previous years and I get like two cents from 2017. Like we got it wrong in 2017 so now we're <laughs> we'd like to pay you back what, what we got wrong. So and this promotes transparency in a way and makes you feel comfortable with it. It's more about transparency anyway, right? more than anything else maybe we were discussing before. I think right. so, yeah. Uh, so you could argue you could argue that maybe in the future technology will will eventually make obsolete um, obsolete the the um, the collective management agencies, but I'm not so sure about that actually. Do we have yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> It's not only a question, it's... Uh, okay, I'm going to say. Uh, so we were talking these days about self-publishing and then or, or joining a label mm -hmm. and the benefits of one or the other or talking about it. Basically, self-publishing, you have to do all the work and you, when you go to a label, people w do that work for you uh, in, a, in a collaborative... In a well, in paper, work. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just left a major label because they didn't do their work, so yeah. <laughs> I'm much ha happier self-publishing. On paper, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Reality all is different. But, yeah, so when uh, this was se seemi seeming familiar to me ab uh, about what you were saying yeah. of uh, your, your rights as an author and then going with management, uh, collective management, management. The, uh, that kind of differs uh, the the same thing b uh, like self publishing I, and I going understand. to a label i understand so I, I was thinking what are the things that uh that spr really does uh, like for me that i wouldn't have to do myself the deci the decisions well well i think this this the the main thing is to actually actually to be able to charge someone for using your work. Mm -hmm. I invite you to, to try to do it on your own. <laughs> what, what, like, not, not, not in every sense, but specifically in this context of radio broadcast, for instance. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's really, um, it's really hard, it's really difficult. I don't know anyone who has ever been able to approach a major radio station and tell them now, oh, by the way, you played my song last week and I want my money now. Like, uh, because I'm not registered with SPI, I want my money. Like, it, it should be that way. Actually, it should even be the other way around. The, the radio station wouldn't even play the song without first asking to play it. That would be the correct way. So what I think what's happening now more and more is we have a copyright law that's been thought out by 19th century writers working in very specific conditions, which still apply in other areas of copyright. I mean, it, for a writer, it's probably much easier to control uh, how many, like, to control his licensing of his work, right? To determine this with this publisher, you're going to make. 300 copies for this and in other areas things happen much faster and there's this discrepancy this huge discrepancy between what law is trying so what's the, the what does law intend 
to do? What does a code of law intend to do? It intends to capture reality in a legal way and try to anticipate solutions to eventual problems or regulate uh, real life situations. So eventually all laws become outdated. Usually what outdates law is technical innovation in most areas. Other in other areas are, you know, progressive societies changing, morals changing, whatever. But specifically in areas that try to regulate economic activities, such as copyright law, which is essentially is what, although the, the purpose is a is a goodwill purpose of protecting the author, and it essentially now regulates an economic activity around intellectual property, and it's getting more and more. It's, it's moving at a slower pace than actually technological innovations. I think you're, you're going to speak, right? Oh, yeah, yeah no, it's, <laughs> this is because for me, also one of the reasons to come is to learn more about this since, so it's uh, talked about this book, copy this book, but it actually g only goes into all these music subjects like in a very uh, summary uh, way and, and it's more in detail about graphic design and, and text and visual art. So mm. I'm really happy to learn about all these subjects. Um, and the rights management societies for me is like a fascinating topic. Yeah. Um, so to get back to what you were saying that it could be uh, adjust in a way that different kinds of musicians have different kinds of remunerations. Mm. I think that's actually the case in, in, in quite some, so maybe not in SPA, yeah. but then, for example, I know that in the German and the Dutch one, they, they have this kind of system where if you make serious music, you get, you get paid better <laughs> than if you make pop popular music yeah, but that also <laughs> opens up a complete can of worms of course yeah, because of course. who is the serious musician and who is and i know that you know i know people who are on like the serious music committee of the dutch of the dutch most biggest one and uh, and i don't know it's these people that that, that they, they 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 do um they've studied um music in conservatory and they make like uh, contemporary classical music and that's their definition of of serious music and mm. things that very serious musicians that fall outside of this will not. So that's interesting. It's a, it's a good I idea, but I it's think, also... I think what happened, what should happen basically is other associations should exist and they would tailor themselves better to, diff for instance, if you're only performing erudite music, maybe it makes more sense to be represented by someone who knows who the players in this area are and negotiate. I mean, Antenna Deutsch has no interest. Uh, Antenna Deutsch is our classical music radio. Probably would be more interested in negotiating a license with an association that represented classical and erudite music perf artists and, and, and composers and performers it than with, with then having to pay this broad, generic, um, generic license based on on uh, listenership uh, to this major entity that represents everyone, every mm -hmm. area from visual arts to. So, so and then that's that's another question then because in Belgium uh, there are like twenty eight of these kind of societies. Of we have one. Yeah. yeah. And then it's interesting is if it's not, a, then it should be a public thing and not a government thing if there's only one. Uh, I, 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 <laughs> then it should be a government thing and not a, a, a private thing, I imagine. But uh, so in Belgium, there is 28, but it is not easy to become one because they're actually stipulated by royal decree, which are the ones. Yeah. And then so I think they do every 10 years, maybe they update yeah. who, who does this. Um, of course, that does make it a bit more difficult for the people who then use the music because they have to negotiate with uh, different people but that brings me to like a, another point that I find really interesting is like you say the radio should should always ask me before I they play my music and of course that's true if you take a really offers rights perspective on arts now I, I was I was about to say that that is not specific that is not uh, I should try to make a distinction between my personal opinions and maybe what the What's copyright law so this is one of the things where there's a complete um, detachment from reality in terms of copyright that's still treating uh, the use of intellectual works as a singular 
moment pre-authorized with set uh, conditions. Um, yeah, but I, I think this 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 idea of pre-authorization is really what I find also in a way very uh, interesting about these rights management organizations. So basically, it's a, it's a kind of compromise where the government realizes, okay, there are situations where you cannot ask in advance each time, so we create this specific statute yeah. that makes it so that, that there can be pre-negotiated deals and then they have to be done by these rights management organizations, of we have, which we have 28 and you have one. Uh, but um, actually, I think from a cultural perspective, this also has a lot of advantages in the sense that the fact that the artist or their heirs or their the person who is the uh, holder of the economic rights gets to decide how works get used hmm. from offers rights perspectives that can that can be good or sound good or feel good but actually from a societal perspective it's not always good because that means that offers get to decide when they get to be played when they get to be covered when they get to be sampled all these things and this this is a, a like a, exactly. a philosophical de debate yeah. but for me this is uh actually not necessarily uh, a bad thing. A, uh, it's no it's not a good thing and for not me not, not necessarily thing. a good thing like for me it's actually uh, at some point it should be also it's actually for me an interesting model that artists they should be remunerated for their la their labor but I think this sort of role that they have now where they can be a censor and they can also set their own price, they can do their individual negotiation. This means that today, for example, I want to sample someone, they get to decide if I get to do it and they also get to decide at what price. And yeah. for me, for culture, this is a bad thing. And there's a tyranny of... Uh, yeah, it's a, a difficult balance between protecting authorship and... Yeah, for me, it's not such a difficult balance in the sense that I feel this is... this this th that. Uh, at some point, like quite quickly, would <laughs> be really up to me. Like for me, this whole control is really important. Like when you start making something, so when you when it comes out and you choose your label, and this is where copyright is so important because you get to to negotiate with where it comes out, with whom and how and what. And but then, th and then at some point, is it still like for the society? Is it still something that, as a society, you want that there is this uh, decision power? of the artist that might have made something 20 years ago or their family that might, you know. So in that sense, I'm not sure I completely agree with the, that it's a bad idea that this is all pre-negotiated. For me, in a way, it's one of the more interesting parts of this model of the rights management organizations. I don't think it's a, a bad idea. What I think is a bad idea is that these associations are not regulated at all. Our copyright law has no... So the... the so basically, they get to decide how they wish to operate. There's no... No transparency. No transparency. And the, the authors are, the artists are basically held hostages of these very untransparent processes. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying for me makes absolute sense. The implementation part of it, which I think is interesting, uh, requires um, requires an intervention, a legal intervention that's not being discussed and proposed. Mm -hmm. And so, if you if you read our um, copyright law code, for instance, which which reproduces basically as 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 they all do now, reproduces basically the gist of of, of Bern, you would you will see no reference. You will see a very small reference to collective, collective uh, management. One of the things that I find really annoying, for instance, is uh, the, the fact that it's considered a representation without appeal. So basically, you get that a lot. So basically, my work could be used by a right-wing political party being licensed directly through SPA. And I could not say anything about it. So there's, it, there's issues to it, ethical issues as well, as in how, how much of my... how much of my... Um, animus can I also abdicate? And there should be more transparent means to understand how the, how the work is being used. I, I'm not saying that this means that the author should have an absolutely tyrannical uh, control over their work. 
I think it's insane that works only fall for a cent to the public domain in 70 years after a, a, an author's death, for instance. Um, but we do need, if we want to implement this in a fair way for all artists, because this, this sort of entities are now benefiting more some artists than others. Yeah, no, for sure, I imagine, and I, I agree. And so I have a question in that sense, mm -hmm. also, and then I'm, then, I'm, then I'm done with my questions. <laughs> uh, so what I was very curious, so I, I imagine how that works on the radio, like, the, because the radio, they have, you know, they can, they can do this administration, mm -hmm. say what they played. But I always wonder, like, I, you know, I buy a song, it doesn't cost me a lot to buy a song, but then sometimes if I play a song in a place and I know that, the, that all public places, mm -hmm. I'm, at least in Belgium, I imagine in Portugal, they pay a kind of, flat fee to the rights management yeah. organizations to be able to play music exactly. but nobody ever asked me for a playlist so i'm like i'm super happy that i get to play like very specific music but i would l wish for the artists who made that music then to be uh, paid yeah. but i'm like how do they know then th that i played this i don't think they know they don't you probably should give your playlist <laughs> They don't. No, but no, that, that's what I'm saying, because nobody ever asked so me for a playlist, for so I'm wondering how this works. For live music, for live music, for live music venues, there usually is a playlist. And, and for it's radios too. And for radios as well. But what he's saying, like, a bar that plays no. ambient music, no. And he cannot know. So what they do is this sort of, there you go. This sort of, okay, let's see statistically, this artist plays more, more on the radio. Yeah. So it makes sense that he plays more on the bar as and well. So there it is. I don't think I don't sorry. think it works. It's going yeah, to work. Like if, if, you, if, if the artist works with a real publisher and the publisher do his work and he goes to SPA and reclaims that I have this set list from this place and my, my author or my, as my artist play there, so I want to receive this. It happens, I know. Okay. Uh, I work I, with that. I, I, I it's, get it's that from a live performance, that's why live performance situation. No, it's not li li like live, live performance. I have an example. A few days ago, I was getting into a supermarket mm. and I... They have a playlist playing, and I listen to a friend uh, music from a friend of mine, and I call him and say, "Hey, it's they're giving, they pl they're playing your music here. It's on the playlist. It's the second time on the same chain of supermarkets uh, in different supermarkets that I, I heard that song, and say, okay, I have to figure out with the uh, with the brand and see where they bought the the playlist right, yeah. and see if they pay it." So I can c collect my, my rights. That's the work of a publisher. Well, if you are an independent, <laughs> if you are an independent, <laughs> okay, if you are an independent uh, artist, you have more problems with that because who's going to, to do that you work can't for run you? Around. Yeah, you should yeah. have a, like a publisher to do that. If you want to be yeah. an artist, you're going to be an artist, or uh, but you should have like someone who is going to be preoccupied to get your incomes uh, 24 hours a day. So I, I still had a couple Kay. more things okay, to talk, but I think this should be a very good time for Diogo to, to talk about, uh, we're, we're going to listen to you, uh, just, just a second, <laughs> for Diogo to talk about um, this other less tyrannical aspect <laughs> of copyright and alternative forms of uh, licensing. Uh, and uh, Diego, who's ha head of legal um, creative commons here in Portugal, uh, is going to talk for 45 to minutes to one hour, give us a, a small presentation, which I think we, we're all going to, to enjoy as well. Can yeah. <laughs> but it's still on this topic, what I was, I was going to say about mm. the, uh, what he said that every, uh, I mean, every shop, every restaurant, every bar has to pay. Uh, mm. for the rights. And I have an extreme example. If I have a sports bar, for example, I have one TV that just shows football all day. I'm still paying. Who's, yeah. getting, the, who's getting the money? Who's getting money for, from broadcasting the, the yeah. football TV? It's not the, the league. It's 
it's, no, it's, SP, it's, it's SPI. Not. So the thing is, the, um, the big artists are still getting the money, even if I'm not uh, playing music. I'll tell you what, yeah. I'll tell you what. This and, is and this could be... Really what. Yeah. Uh, every year, SPI invites his most um, proliferous uh, artists and tells them, listen, we had this amount of unclaimed money this year and we're going to distribute it to you guys. <laughs> this, is, so this is like out in the open and nobody knows, does yeah. anything about this. So the, the proposal you had about uh, giving a more fair share to the smaller artists, you wouldn't even have to cut it from the big artists. So, uh, I mean, yeah. from the fair share of the big artists. The, the money is there. problem that I was talking about because most of the independent um, artists they don't reclaim their, their share that's why they, they leave money on the table yeah. all, 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 all the years because there's no one to reclaim that the majors do that their, their jobs the independent ones doesn't do it that. so they don't they know. but they should learn mm -hmm. if you want to be an artist and you want to get your money from it you should learn what do you need to earn money in the industry? Yeah. What the ways? It's it's like the record company, the publisher, the live concerts. Everything is important for for getting money. I absolutely agree. Uh, I agree what you're saying. I, I think that's what we're doing here, basically. Yeah. But <laughs> but also, I don't think you should blame. In if if we if you we use a mo metaphor like this that I think is really is really um, similar that we shouldn't blame it on the city citizens uh, for not being uh, s uh, so participant in democracy. The thing is that there are processes that the that power prefers them to be dense and untransparent, yeah. so that uh, not everyone participates. The things that things are made in a way that people don't feel like participating because they feel ignorant, they feel powerless, and this is done to be like that. This they is not like just lack of interest from the people. They mostly feel this is uninvited. Like, yeah, this is lack of education, and this, this education is, uh, is, uh, is responsibility from the government. Is, uh, of course, is also your own, our own responsibility as individuals, but if things are made in a way to make you always feel outside and always powerless and always uninvited, like Nunu says, this is a problem of structure and, uh, and of transparency and it's not a problem of uh, that each person should, uh, that just e each citizen is responsible for. You know what I mean? Yeah. And in that sense, I'm not a fan of uh, regulation. I think we're overly, overly, we overly regulate uh, and, and there's no, I think this is a big issue with countries that are not uh, common law and there are mostly positive positivists and the, the, you legislate a lot and sometimes you don't even laws don't even have time to set before they're altered and you can't really understand their effects. It's a complicated matter because again, you're trying to anticipate all aspects of life through law, which is impossible. And um, reg these problems have been identified. They're, they're, they're very, very clear. And n there's no push for regulation of collective, collective or better regulation of collective, um, collective management entities. Uh, and someone's profiting from this, <laughs> no doubt. Yeah, but just um, what George Loro was saying also is that if there's uh, so much unclaimed money and we know that uh, smaller and more independent uh, artists don't have the resources mo most of the times to claim uh, this, uh, I think what he was proposing is uh, a percentage of this money goes to mm. uh, the, the ones that are of course registered because you, you can't pay people who are not registered. Uh, which would would leave me out, but okay, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's that's a personal thing. But uh, but the, uh, and the, to distribute this unclaim, and in this way, you wouldn't even have to take the cut from the bigger artists. And this was also proposed in this same program by I think I don't know if, if it was Andrew Dubber or Terry Tal Talsley because 
the truth is that this, uh, these uh, questions are, ra are being raised not only in this track, but also in other tracks, like with technology and with, uh, and with uh, release planning and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. so, but yeah, there could be more fairer ways. No, like uh, yeah. We have a question here from, or comments and questions from uh, Bruno Bizarro, uh, who is um, agreeing with Pedro here, that that's why authors should have publishers. And while you were talking, Hugo, <laughs> another comment. Again, that's why it's important to have a publisher. And then we have a question from Bruno Bizarro again. If there's no leg legislation regarding music, how is that going to help artists and authors? Are you kidding? Sorry? Like, if there's no legislation regarding music, how is it going to help artists and authors? No, but like there, 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 there is legislation regarding... Uh, uh, yeah, but I think it was more like a um, conversation. We have yeah, yeah, but it's not about not having legislation. Of course, it matters. We need maybe more, uh, more uh, specific legislation that is more and just to everyone. And updated. Yeah, and better updated and updated, updated to reflect legislation. To reflect society. So I'm going to uh, hand it yeah. to Diogo now. Thanks for your comments <laughs> on the live stream. <laughs> it's very we appreciate waiting. it. Maybe and there's a, there's a few I themes I, I left off, but maybe we can discuss them later. And, and thank you very much for inviting me. And I hope that this has been useful and helpful for you all and that you have enjoyed this. Yeah. All right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can I take a moment? Consigo. Nada, eu é que agradeço porque acho que é...